Hello everyone. Welcome to another part of What If Deku Ran an Orphanage. If you enjoy the story please like subscribe and share the video. It really helps me out. I did not write the story. The original writer is Kayadon. Please go support them. Now let us dive in. So what now? You are an idiot. Sheena and Yanda were sitting in Sheena's room. Sheena was currently sitting on her bed while Yanda stared her down with her arms crossed. I thought she was a threat. Sheena defended herself, giving Yanda a pleading look. Yes, I get why you did it. But the way you went about it was utterly stupid. Yanda scolded her. If the girl was just waiting for any chance to hurt father, she would have done it long before we got the chance to stop her. Meaning she either didn't mean any harm, at least not yet, or she was waiting for a good chance to kill father in an isolated place. Meaning the best course of action was just to keep an eye on her and make sure she's never alone with father or anyone to be safe. Had things gone poorly, she could have killed you, claimed it was an accident, and we'd be back where we started, just with you dead. I wouldn't have lost. Sheena thought with a pout. I'm strong. Yeah, and so is she. I don't know much about combat, but I do know that it's not a simple matter. Get overconfident or make a mistake and that could be your death. Yanda pointed out. She wasn't trying to kill me, I know what it looks like when someone tries to kill you. Sheena pointed out, recalling the way Nizg had fought her. But you didn't know that when you went in, did you? Yanda asked her. No. Sheena pouted guiltily. Ugh, that being said. I can't say that this wasn't useful. We did get some rather useful information from this fight. Yanda conceded. Doesn't make what you did any less stupid, but at the very least we can call you a useful idiot instead a regular idiot. Why are you so mean? Sheena asked tears in the corner of her eyes. Because I have to hear every complaint, whine, cry and depraved and depressing thought that goes through everyone's heads, so excuse me if I'm in a bad mood. Yanda explained, completely unsympathetic towards the younger girl's plight. But also because you've made the job of getting everyone else to trust you much, much harder. Now Sheena was actually crying. This scolding was somehow worse than the one Izuku had given her. This was a mistake. I wish I never attacked that girl. Good. Yanda sighed. But I supposed I've scolded you enough. We have work to do. I've already told the others that the fight was a misunderstanding, but let's just say it didn't do you any favors. So now we really need to find a way for you to stand out and get people to like you. Yanda then pulled out a pack of tissues and threw it at Sheena. Now dry those tears, we have work to do. Were you planning on making me cry? Sheena asked as she looked down at the tissue. Yep. Now move. Yanda ordered. We have a busy day ahead of us. Yanda took Sheena to the kitchen where she had laid out two pieces of bread and a slice of cheese. Now, cooking is a very good way to get people to like you. Fuku is a great example of that. Pretty much everyone likes her by now, despite her hiding from half the people here. Yanda explained. So first, we're going to start with something simple. We have an American guest, let's see if we can surprise her with a grilled cheese sandwich. I don't know, I've never cooked anything before. Sheena pointed out, nervously twiddling her thumbs. It's not that hard. I'm sure you can manage something so simple. Yanda scoffed. A few minutes later, Sheena and Yanda were looking down at the counter, at the result of Sheena's work. A plate with what looked like a lump of charcoal. How? Was all Yanda asked. How did you manage to mess it up this badly? And why is the cheese still here? Oh right, the cheese. Sheena looked down at the cheese she forgot to put between the bread. I knew was forgetting something. Yanda facebombed. All right, I have many things I want to say to you right now, but I know if I make you cry again it's going to waste more time. So let's try something even simpler. The psychic girl went over to the pantry and pulled out a cup of cup ramen. This should be impossible to mess up. All you have to do is follow the directions of the cup. A few minutes later, Sheena and Yanda were staring at the counter, which had a flaming cup of ramen on it. Sheena cringed and waited for the mental tongue lashing she was sure to receive. But it never came. Yanda was simply too stunned to think. Instead, she walked over to the wall and slammed her head into it a couple of times. Sorry, I just needed to hurt myself to take my mind off whatever this was. Yanda explained as she turned to Sheena, showing the bruise on her head. I'm pretty that's not good. Sheena replied. Neither is your cooking. Yanda shouted, giving Sheena a headache as she screamed the words into her head. 
While Sheena cowered in fear, Yanda took a second to calm herself down. Okay. Yanda said after taking a minute. Clearly, you are not good at cooking. Let's try something else, shall we? Before I lose what's left of my sanity. Sheena and Yanda were now in the training room or rather looking into the training room from the doorway. The training room currently had puddles of blood and piles of organs lying around, which Sheena was looking at with disgust. Okay, another thing you can do to make people like you is help clean. Yanda explained, pointing to the cart of cleaning products they'd brought. People hate cleaning, so if you do it for them, they'll like you more. Okay. That makes sense, how do I clean this? Sheena asked. Just use these chemicals, mop up the floor, and put all of the organs into this black bag. Yanda explained, pointing at the various supplies she'd need to clean this mess. Here I'll. Vrrrr. Yanda stopped that thought when she suddenly felt her phone vibrate. She pulled out her phone and saw a text message from her man inside UA Mineta. I have what you asked me for, the text read. Yanda grinned sinisterly. Give me one second, dear. I need to take this. Yanda walked back towards the training room, with a huge grin on her face. If nothing else, at least one thing went her way today. However that grin then swiftly fell, the moment she saw the training room. Instead of there being puddles of blood, blood was now splattered all over the place, in fact, there somehow appeared to be more of it. In the center of the room was Sheena, desperately trying to mop things up, while being covered in blood and organs. Yanda just stared at her for a while, before thinking to herself. Why does it look like there's more blood here than before, if I couldn't read minds I'd swear she was doing this on purpose. Stop. Yanda ordered, causing Sheena to freeze up. Just stop. Before you make things even worse. I'm sorry. Sheena apologized tearfully. Just get over here so we can clean you up and move on to the next thing. Yanda mentally sighed. It's almost lunch, surely you can wash dishes. Crack. Yanda couldn't look anymore. But she didn't really need to either. She could tell by Sheena's thoughts that she broke yet another plate. How many plates was that? The tenth? Sheena shamefully admitted. Turn off the water and get down from there. Yanda ordered. Let's move on. Yanda had taken them to the library next, where she sat and Sheena down at one of the tables and set out various papers on the desk. Now some of the people here are less smart than others, so let's test your intelligence to see if you're smart enough to help them out. Yanda explained. I've set up these tests to show how well you do in multiple subjects. Let's hope you can ace at least one of these. Slam. Yanda slammed her head into the table, into the papers she just finished grading. And on those papers were some rather low scores. The highest being 31% and the lowest being 8%. Eh. <laughs> Yanda screamed in frustration. I'm sorry. Yanda apologized tearfully. Next. Thing. Now. Yanda shouted. Awa. Sheena and Yanda were now in Shiruku's room, as Sheena was now attempting to knit a sock under the supervision of Shiruku herself. It was going about as expected, as Sheena had just pricked herself with the needle for the twenty-second time. Shiruku winced and grabbed Sheena's hands to stop her. I don't think you're cut out for knitting. Yanda facebombed, slapping her now bruised forehead. Otoko didn't know what he was looking at. He was just doing some panting in the art room when Sheena and Yanda came in, and Yanda had Sheena start. Painting for lack of a better word. It was more like Sheena was just splattering paint all over a canvas widely, and what came out reflected that. Apparently, it was supposed to be a cat, but it was completely unrecognizable. Yanda then smashed her head against a canvas and dragged Sheena out of the room. Weird. Yanda and Sheena had returned to Sheena's room, where Yanda was lying motionless on the ground, while Sheena sat on the bed, looking ashamed. Sheena, how is it you seem to have and forgive me for being blunt, absolutely no talent whatsoever? Yanda asked, not removing her face from the floor. Well, I'm not used to doing things as myself. Most of the time whenever people wanted me to do anything, they wanted me to do it as Gammy. Sheena explained. And when I'm Gammy, it's just so different. I'm not used to being me. Ugh, I hate that that makes sense. Damn those quirkus bastards. Yanda thought to herself, before her eyes widened, as a realization suddenly came to her. I'm an idiot. I can't believe I didn't think of this sooner. Yanda picked herself up and jumped to her feet, before looking over at Sheena. Sheena. Can't you just kill your talentlessness or something? Or turn into Gammy? 
then you can do pretty much anything. Sheena frowned. I, I don't want that. What do you mean you don't want that? Yanda screamed so loud it caused Sheena to jump back against the wall of her bed. I'm sorry. Sheena quickly apologized. But I, I don't want to use my quirk for everything. I sometimes it feels like the only thing good about me is my quirk, even though I don't really like my quirk. I want to use my own talents or just get better at things I'm not good at. Also, I don't like cutting myself. Sheena looked down at the scars that littered her pale arms and legs. Her black dress covered up the scars over the rest of her body, but she could practically feel them. Yanda on the other hand was fuming. On the one hand, all of her plans had failed, and Sheena was refusing to go through with the simple solution that had helped take care of this in a snap. But at the same time, she did understand where she was coming from. A lot of people just saw her as the girl who reads minds and while she didn't really resent that, she did appreciate it when people looked at her as more than a quirk with a person attached. Ugh. Okay. Fine. I will think of some other ways you can make yourself useful. Yanda said, before pulling out her thought silencers. But first I'm going to take a nap, I hit my head too many times. Yanda placed her silencers into her ears and turned them on before laying on the floor and falling asleep. Sheena breathed a sigh of relief. Yanda was not as bad as she first thought. She was a bit mean and forceful, but she was a rather hard worker, and she seemed to have good intentions even if the way she went about them left something to be desired. Then again, if Sheena complained about that, she'd be a hypocrite. Oh. Sheena laid back on her bed and wondered what she should do now. She was still grounded, and she wasn't friends with anyone here yet so she was kind of at a loss as to what to do next. Well, one idea came to mind. Something she'd done when she'd been grounded bored before. Ugh. Fuku groaned as she walked through the halls back to her room, utterly exhausted. First, someone had made a mess in the kitchen. Somehow they managed to set a ramen cup on fire, which was a pain to clean up. Then after she made more food, someone broke like a dozen dishes, which was even more of a pain to clean. She couldn't wait to get back into her room and relax to some anime intros. Darker than night. Deep in the woods you'll find. Standing alone. A circus that no one knows. Master of all. Nearly ten meters tall. Watching the show. As that will slowly grow. All who perform smile with faces torn. Fuku stopped as suddenly she heard some wonderful singing coming from somewhere close. That voice, it's beautiful. But who is that? Is it one of the new girls? Despite her normally cautious nature, Fuku found herself walking towards the sound of that voice, wanting to know who was singing so wonderfully. Happy with glee. Strange as they look to me. Shall the fun start? Follow me. To the Darkwood Circus, please. Join the festivity. It's right here. Fuku stopped in front of one of the doors, which she realized was Sheena's, and looked at it with fearful white eyes. No, that voice can't be her, can it? Come and see the two-headed freak of nature. Gaze at a siren, her flesh deformed. Fear the blue beast and his love for cold decaying meals that once were warm. Did we ask to breathe? Did we ask to only be abused? Living in bodies like these. Suddenly the singing got louder, and even more beautiful than before, so much so that Fuku's fear was overtaken by awe. And all she could pay attention to was the song. When you look at me. What is it that you see? Now a face rotting and torn at the seams. Through the pain, I scream. How it hurts so badly. But we can't help it or do anything. As the girl would weep telling me this sadly. We perform always the circus repeats. How I love the show. How I love it also. Can you see how fun a circus can be? As our flesh decays. And our eyes melt away. With a face rotting. It's fun every day. How I long to die. Why am I still alive? Anyone. Help me escape from this life. You can never leave. Yes, I have a feeling long ago someone had told this to me. The song died down into humming and Fuku was released from the spell of the music and was able to think again. That was beautiful. Her voice is amazing. Fuku was almost in tears from not only how great the singing was, but also the lyrics. Some of which stirred inside her. Part of her wanted to give applause, but that would mean giving away the fact that she was listening in, and the last thing she wanted to do was go face to face with someone as scary as Sheena. You heard my singing? Asked the imaginary Sheena in Fuku's head as she held up her scythe with a scary look in her eyes. Now you have to die. 
Nope. No, I'm good. Time to get going, Fuku. Fuku thought to herself as she quickly and silently made her way toward her room. But I hope she really is trustworthy, it'd be a shame for a voice that pretty to belong to someone evil. Nara and Alice were sitting in the library at one of the tables, with various books all over the table. Why you are a really fast learner. Nara praised the younger girl with an amazed look on her face. It's only been a couple of days but your Japans has already improved a lot. Alice blushed and turned away to hide her smile. It's nothing. I'm kinda cheating though. Cheating? Nara raised a brow. Alice pulled out a small, folded up piece of paper from her dress pocket and unfolded it before showing it to Nara. 12.30, Nara will help Alice Bate learn Japanese. Alice Bate will understand things very quickly and learn very fast. The paper read in English. After managing to read it, Nara's eyes widened with surprise and realization. That's right, I forgot how powerful your quirk is. That's a really clever way to use it. Alice nodded. I've learned so many things because of it. It's my favorite way to use my quirk. Really? Nara asked. Uh-huh. Well, I haven't used my quirk in a lot of different ways yet. Alice admitted, looking down at the paper. It's kind of scary. Nara didn't respond at first. Mainly because she agreed. The thought of someone being able to manipulate your actions and even thoughts without you knowing and without having to be anywhere near you. Was scary. But she didn't want to judge her because of that. That would kind of defeat the purpose of the place like this and it just felt wrong. It's only scary if you use it for scary things. Nara encouraged her, giving her a pat on the head. But you don't seem like the type to do that, so you're not scary in my book. Alice smiled and blushed once more. Thank you. So cute. Nara internally gushed, trying her hardest not to let it show and make her look like an idiot. Sup loser. Shouted a familiar voice coming into the library. Ugh. Nara smiled and good mood instantly vanished as Ken walked over towards them. What do you want Ken? Just taking a break from my job to see the new kid. Ken said, taking a sip of a juice box and looking over at Alice who looked at him curiously. Nara sighed. Well I guess there's no better time to introduce you too. Alice this is my idiot brother Ken. Feel free to ignore anything he says. Ken stuck his tongue at his sister who did the same thing. Hello. Alice greeted, giving a polite wave. Hey. Ken responded before looking her over. So you're the American. I thought you'd be fat. Slap. Nara reached over the table and slapped her brother on the top of his head, her face red with anger. Ken. What the hell? Oh. What? I thought most Americans were fat. At least that's what everyone told me. Ken hissed rubbing the top of his head. Ken that's super racist. Nara scolded him. American isn't a race, is it? Ken asked, not 100% sure of that statement. I wait, is American a race? Nara herself asked, her rage subsiding for a moment as she thought about that for a second. As they were thinking about that, they heard a snicker and looked down at Alice, who was trying to hide her laughter. American isn't a race silly. Alice said, still trying not to laugh. It's um actually I don't know what it is either. Well then let's just say that I'm right and be done with it. Ken smirked while crossing his arms, Nara opened her mouth to counter but Ken started walking away before she could. Anyway, welcome to the house new kid, try not to let my sister infect you with loser. And with that he was gone before Nara could get a word in. Ugh, he is such a pain. Nara groaned. I think he's funny. Alice added. She could tell there was no real malice between the two and that their teasing was simply part of their sibling bond. It was somewhat similar to how her mother acted towards her aunt. Ugh, don't let him hear that or his head will get so big he won't be able to walk through doors. Nara snickered, causing Alice to laugh with her. After they settled down something came to mind. He said he had a job. Alice noted, looking up at Nara curiously. Oh right that. Nara sighed. I mean yeah technically he's helps design games. Alice looked at her with wide eyes, unsure if she had understood that correctly. I'm sorry, could you say that in English? Okay. He helps make games. Nara said in English this time. Huh? Alice shouted out in confusion and amazement. He makes games. How? What kind? Does he use his quirk? 
Does he do it alone? How does Dash? Whoa. Slow down. Nara told her in English, not wanting to get overwhelmed with all these questions. I guess I should have seen this coming. A kid working on a video game isn't exactly normal. Well, I guess the best way to explain this would be to start with our quirks. Alice's eyes sparkled with excitement, and she suddenly pulled out a notebook and got ready to write. Huh. What a coincidence. Nara thought, before getting on with her explanation. Well, me and Ken technically have the same quirk, but they do different things. It's called Omni, and it allows both of us to transform into ten different forms. But each of us have different forms. Cool. Alice cooed, looking up at her with amazement. Show me. Please, please show me. Nara wanted to refuse as it would be rather impractical to transform in the middle of a conversation, but she couldn't find it within herself to refuse when Alice was looking at her like she was the most amazing person in the world right now. All right. Just give me a second. She then activated her Omnitrix and started looking for the least inconvenient form she had right now. Alice looked at her Omnitrix curiously, taking a close look at each silhouette. After a few seconds of fiddling, Nara finally found the right form. All right, now you might want to cover your eyes, there is gonna be a flash. Nara slammed down on the dial, and Alice covered her eyes as a pink flash consumed the girl. When the flash died down and Alice lowered her hands from her eyes, she saw that Nara was gone and in her place was Ditto. Tada! Nara said, raising up her arms to show off her current form. I call this one Ditto, while Ken called it Ditto and the name just kinda stuck. Amazing! Alice rushed over and looked at Ditto, moving around to see them from every angle, while frantically writing things down. Each form has a different quirk, and this one can do this. Ditto suddenly split into two. Tada! Wawa! Wow. Alice gasped, looking at the two Dittos. How does it work? It looked like your body just split in two. Are stretchy? If you cut off an arm would it turn into a clone and grow back? Can I touch you? Alice, please slow down. One of the Naras said at the same time. Even with two of us we can only answer so much. Let's just get back onto the main topic here. The other Nara said. Ken has a form called Upgrade, which lets him merge with technology, control it, and well, upgrade it. He can even use it to program things like games. That's amazing. I want to see it. Please oh please let me see it. Alice begged. Hee <laughs> hee. All right if you're that excited. Ken should be getting back to work now, so we should be able to see him. Nara merged her two selves back into one. Come on, follow me. Nara, now back to normal, had brought Alice to the game design room, and the moment she stepped in, she looked around with wonder. The room was covered in various different machines and computers, and all of them were currently taken over by Ken in his upgrade form. Whoa. Alice looked at all the monitors, rapidly modeling and creating new models and features. Oh hey guys. Came Ken's voice from one of the monitors. What do you want I'm kind of busy here. I just wanted to show Alice how you're making the game. Nara explained. So you came to see the master at work. Ken said, popping his head out of the computer screen. Alice gasped when she saw this and immediately ran over to him. Can I touch you? Please? Uh, sure. Ken agreed, a bit weirded out by the sudden strange question. Immediately, Alice touched Ken's head, and much to her delight it felt like a mix of goo and metal and was as cold as both. I've never felt something like this before. What are you made of? I have no idea. Ken answered honestly. No one does really. I'm kinda half machine and half not machine. Organic. Nara corrected. Yeah, that. Ken confirmed, before slinking back into the monitor. Anyway, I got some more work to do. Only have a few more minutes before I transform back. All right, all right. Nara turned Alice towards her. Ken only programs the game, but all the ideas and designs are actually made by other people. It's actually pretty impressive, they have a character designer, a monster designer, a writer and more. Can I meet them? Alice asked. Um, well the monster designer is out right now, and the writer and world designer is, let's just say it'll take a bit before you can meet them face to face. But you can Shiruku. She's the character designer, and she also makes clothes. Nara explained. Like hats? Alice suddenly asked, her eyes gleaming with anticipation. Um, maibe? 
Nara wondered where the heck that question came from. I've never seen her make one before but I'm sure she would if you asked her. Somehow Alice's eyes grew even wider, and she beamed so hard she almost appeared to be glowing. I'm guessing you want to meet her, so just come with me. Nara said, taking Alice's hand. Well. The moment they entered Shiruka's room, Alice's head started swerving around so fast that Nara was worried she'd break her neck. Meanwhile Alice was in pure awe. The room was entirely covered in all sorts of clothes. Cool clothes, cute clothes, pretty clothes. All of them were laid out on the walls. There were of course lots clothes making materials littered around the room. Oh and there were also spiders calling all over the room, but Nara had warned her of that beforehand, so she wasn't freaked out. In fact she was far more amazed than anything as she watched hundreds of spiders help decorate the various clothes. It was mesmerizing. My my who do we have here? Shiruka was currently sewing a dress on the ceiling and stopped what she was doing to lower herself to the ground. Shiruka reached the ground and turned herself right side up, right in front of Alice, towering over the small girl completely. Is this the American girl I heard about? Alice nodded. You make very pretty clothes. Shiruka smiled. Nothing like hearing a cute girl compliment her efforts. Thank you. You have a very pretty body. Especially your hair. Did she really just say you have a very pretty body? Nara thought to herself. Both Alice and Shiruku inspected each other, as both girls were very curious about the body of the other. Would you mind if I took your measurements? I can already think of a ton of dresses that would look absolutely adorable on you. Shiruku asked her, already planning out everything she was going to do. Okay, but can I have a hat too? Like a really cool one. Alice asked hopefully. Hmm, okay, I can definitely make some cute outfits with hats. Shiruka said with a very pleased expression. Well it looks like they're getting along. I should probably leave them be, I can finally get some studying done. Nara thought. Well, I'll leave you two to it. Have fun. Wait. Alice suddenly ran over and wrapped her arms around Nara's waist before saying in English. Thank you. Well now I have diabetes worth it. Nara thought as she hugged her back. Snap. Nara and Alice looked over to the source of the sound and saw Shiruku holding a camera. I'll send this to you later. Shiruku said with a smile. Nara was very happy to be surrounded by such good people. Eh. This is the life. Chol was currently sitting by the pool in her swimsuit with two legs in the water and a few drinks next to her. It had been a long day, and while she did enjoy paperwork, work was still work and it got exhausting. But at the same time, there was nothing better than relaxing after a long day of work. Mommy! Well, some things were better. Chol looked back and saw her daughter running towards her, wearing something she hadn't seen before. It was a purple dress with spider web like black lines all over it, as well as a hat with the two fake black spiders on it. One big one small. Mommy, look, look. That spider girl made me these cute clothes and this hat. Alice said as she ran up to her mother, before spinning around to show off her new attire. Wow, it looks very nice, sweetheart. Chol smiled, it was good to see her daughter this excited. Looks like you have a new hat to add to your collection. Alice nodded very enthusiastically. I had so much fun today. This place is wonderful. I told you you'd like it my little pendragon. Chol chuckled as she pulled her daughter closer and kissed her on the forehead. Please make sure to thank Mr. Midoriya for all this. Without him we'd be in a much worse situation. Alice nodded in agreement. Mr. Midoriya is really amazing. He made this whole place even though he's not an adult yet. Believe me Lit Pendragon, he's more competent than most adults I work with. Chol chuckled. Honestly when she heard she'd have to work for a teenager, she was more than a bit concerned. But Izuku had proven to be as intelligent as he was kind, actually no he was far more kind than intelligent, a bit too kind actually which was proving to be his biggest flaw. But having a boss whose problem was being too nice was nice problem to have. I'm glad you had fun Pendragon. Chol said, lovingly addressing her daughter by her nickname. I'm sure today is just the first of many adventures. Izuka was on his way to Niza's room with a plate of food in hand. It had been about a week since Sheena's attack and Niz had still refused to come out of her room to the surprise of no one. But at the very least she had made herself comfortable in her room. Knock knock. Izuka knocked on Niz's door. Niz it's me Izuku. I have your lunch. 
The only people Nis let into her room were Fu, Sanson, and Izuku himself, but Izuku hoped with time that she would open up. Suddenly the metal door opened, and Izuku could now enter. Nis's room had changed rather drastically. Seeing as Nis was a shut-in, she needed to find things to do as a shut-in. Fortunately for her, there was a friend. An ally to all shut-ins around the world. Anim. Yes, Nis had gotten rather hooked on anime, and her room reflected that. Posters of different anime guys and girls covered the walls, various figures lined her shelves, and there were two body pillows next to Nis, who was sitting on a beanbag chair, watching more anime. No you dummy, Sakura is the best choice, she's your childhood friend. Nis yelled at the screen. She is obviously the best wifu. Where did she even learn that word? Izuku thought to himself as he entered the room and closed the door behind him. Nis had become an otaku in no time flat and Izuku wasn't sure what to think of that. On the one hand, Izuka didn't have an inherent problem with otakus but... Don't worry Sakura, I will always love you, Ni nice said to one of her body pillows, and she caressed it lovingly. But sometimes their behaviors could be problematic. Hey Nis, nice, Izuka said to get her attention. I have your food. Without a word, got up and grabbed the plate, before sitting back down, her eyes never leaving the screen. Yeah, this is not healthy. Izuka sighed. Nis, nice, can you, pause that for a second. Nis pouted for a second but quickly complied, taking the remote and pausing the show for the time being. What? I... Izuka took a second to think of the best way to go about this. He didn't want to try and force her out of her comfort zone, or even push her out of it, especially since she just started making a comfort zone, but he did want to see if he could expand that zone, just a bit. I'm very glad that you're getting comfortable here. That you're starting to feel a bit safe. But I was wondering if maybe you'd be willing to talk to people more. It doesn't have to be anyone you don't know. Maybe just me or Fu or Sanson? I just don't want you to get lonely. I'm not lonely, I have so many friends here, Ni nice said, gesturing to all the figurines and body pillows. I have Sakura, Hinata, Machida, Zero, Rimuru, and all my friends on the internet. So that's where she learned those words. Izuka cringed internally. He couldn't push any more than he already was, given the situation, but he was liking how this unfolded less and less. Well, so long as you're happy. But I would consider talking to Fu and Sansan a bit more. If you want to. Nis frowned at that. They don't really seem to talk much. Oh yeah. Izuka quickly realized the fault with his logic. Neither Fu nor Sansan were particularly talkative, especially around people they were unfamiliar with. Well, then I guess nothing can be done. I'll leave you be, but if you ever want to talk to me just call. Ok. Nis nodded, before looking back at the TV and unpausing. Izuka left the room, giving Nis a concerned look all the while. Soon Izuka was out of the room and had closed the door behind him, before immediately going into a slump. This was not a good situation. Nis was getting comfortable but in a way that could be problematic in the future. At least with Fuku she actually wanted to go out and talk to people, Ni seemed to have no desire to do the same, and she had reason to not feel safe outside of her room here. And he couldn't do anything about it without the risk of making her feel scared or uncomfortable, and maybe even destroying her trust in him. Ugh. I need to take something for this headache. Izuku thought as he rubbed his temples. All I can do now is wait and build her trust in me. Things were not going as planned. True, the caretaker was a very nice person. He just radiated a sense of safety and kindness she'd never felt before. Never something she'd felt from her parents anyway. It hurt to accept, but it seemed like Fu was right. Her parents hadn't truly loved her. Some part of her always knew she just didn't want it to be true. But now that she'd failed, there was no point in denying the truth any longer. She couldn't return, so she might as well embrace this new chance. Not that Nis gave her much choice. It was bizarre really, that girl coming out of nowhere, but she was an opportunity. So she allowed her to act while she lay dormant. The problem was, that Nis was an incompetent coward. She had no desire to stay in a room for the rest of her life, debating who was the true husband o with morons on the internet. Something needed to give. It seemed she'd have to intervene once more. Fu walked up to Nis's room with a plate of food in his hand. Nis I have your dinner. Come in. Came Nisa's voice on the other side. But there was something off about it. Fu raised his guard and entered the room as the door opened. When he came in he saw Nisa, sitting on her beanbag chair, looking at the screen. 
Fu took a close look at her from behind, and once again he got that feeling of wrongness. Nisa didn't seem as enraptured as she usually was with what she was watching nor was she clutching a figurine or body pillow. Something was up, he was sure of it. Hello, Fu. Nisa said in a voice that was far too sweet. And that's when Fu figured it out. Hey not Nisa, it's been a while since we last talked hasn't it, Fu said in response. You already tried this act back in the forest, so how about we just skip this part? Okay? There was a short pause before Ganes turned to look at Fu with a sharp glare. You're too smart you know that? One moment, Nis was sitting down in her room, watching anime as usual. And then the next thing she knew, she was waking up on a bed, being stared down by Kiba and Fuku. Huh? Nis shot up and looked at both girls with alarm. About time you woke up. You need to answer for yourself. Kiba glared at her harshly. W what? Nis backed up as far away from them as she could. What how did I get here? Answer for what? What did I do? Something horrible, take a look. Kiba pointed at Nisa's chest. Nisa looked down at her chest and quickly her face scrunched up in disgust. Tapped to her chest was a note with the words Bichigo is best girl or written on it. How could you say something so horrid? Fuku asked her. Wait. Wait. I didn't write this. I don't know what happened, but I'd never write something like this. Nis defended herself, her fears currently put to the side by her fan rage. I didn't even think Darling in the Franks was that good. Okay, I wouldn't go that far, Okiba argued. Um, I kinda lost interest when they went into space. Fuku admitted, getting a slightly betrayed look from Kiba. I'm sorry, I couldn't keep up with the plot anymore. Listen it's all very simple. Kiba started explaining. Lady Kiba, I don't think having big boobs gives you an advantage in a fight, Fuku argued. The three girls were now sitting in a circle on the floor of Kiba's room, continuing their lengthy discussion. Nonsense! The larger your boobs are the more flesh there is between your heart and an attack. Kiba argued. And they're also very bouncy, I'm sure they could negate an attack. I don't think that's possible, Nis argued, before going into thought. Then again, I don't remember ever seeing someone get hit in the boobs. Obviously Yanderas are worse than Sundaras. Yanderas are creepy murderers and Sundaras are just annoying at worst. Kiba argued. Most of the time I think that Sundaras are pretty cute. But they're everywhere. Nis complained. In almost every anime, the first or second girl is almost always at Sundara and they're just so mean. At least Yanderas are more rare. Oh wow, they both make good points. Fuku thought as she went into deep contemplation on which deer was worse. Guns! Nis shouted her and Kiba were face to face, locked in a heated argument. Swords! Kiba shouted back. Guns! Swords! Guns! Swords! Guns! Swords! Gun swords! Fuku added to try and appease both sides. The two looked at her curiously. Gun swords! They then looked back at each other and shook hands. Gun swords! Lady Kiba, I don't know how you're not getting this, Fuku said, looking at Kiba sadly. Isekais are amazing, even if there are a lot of them. I'm sorry Fuku but they're overdone and boring. Kiba argued firmly crossing her arms. Look, here is the plot to every Isekai ever. A person dies, gets reincarnated, gets overpowered ability, and never has any real problems. It's just boring. It's not that simple. Not all of them are overpowered from the start, sometimes they have to work for their O. Nis argued. Like that time I got reincarnated as a slime or the spider one. And even if they are overpowered, the show can still be super wholesome. Fuku added. Like in Kuma Kuma Bear or that one about killing slimes for 300 years. It's like a comfy slice of life fantasy. Keep aside. I mean, maybe not all isekais are bad, but most of them are. Like that one about being turned into a vending machine. Okay, actually, that one is good, Nis argued. Let explain dash. Ah ha ha ha. All the girls were beside themselves with laughter as they tried to stay upright. Oh, oh, oh wait. My favorite joke was the one where she covered her friend in slime. Kiba added. I remember that. I laughed so hard I had to pause it. Nis laughed. I'm still not over Rengoku's death, Fuku admitted, looking down at her legs. I know right. Kiba agreed. He was such a great character, why did he have to die? 
and so soon too. Knees added. He was only there for one arc. Couldn't he have at least died in the final like dash? So we all agree that sword art online is trash, right? Knees asked. Trash is a strong word, but yeah, I don't like it. Kiba agreed. Kirito's just so boring, Fuku added. Did you guys know about that SAO spin off that's actually good? Knees asked them. The other two's eyes went wide and they shook their heads. Oh, you should watch it. It's about Gun Gale Online and Dash. While the girls were having their discussion, Fu was on the other side of Kiba's door, listening in. Looks like that did the trick. Fu thought. The girls had been talking for hours now, and he was pretty sure some bond had been formed. With that, his mission had been complete. Now he just needed to file the report. So you met with the other personality again. Izuku and Fu were in his office, with serious expressions on their face. Fu nodded. It wasn't for long. She didn't really want to stick around. But I did confirm two different things. And those are? Izuku paid close attention. One, what she wants. Or at least what she says she wants. Fu explained. I think she was being honest, but I can't tell for sure. But she said that she just wanted her old life to disappear. I see. Izuku took a second to try and figure out what that meant exactly, but that was a lot to try and put together, so he put it to the side for now. And what was the second thing you confirmed? Her name, Fu explained. It's Kira. And welcome everyone to the first episode of Midoriya News. Ken and Nara were currently dressed in tiny suits, sitting at a news station desk with a green screen behind them, imitating a newsroom. Where we report all the insanity that happens here at the Midoriya Foundation. Ken continued. I'm Ken, here with my sister Nara, and we will be your reporters for today. Huh. Was honestly expecting you to introduce me with some kind of insult. Nara said, giving her brother a confused look. No need. The comments will do that for me because the world gets to be subjected to the sight of your face. Ken smirked. Oh, that's rich coming from the guy whose only dating experience comes from a girl who wanted to turn you into a dog. Nara fired back. Ken's face went red with embarrassment, and he decided now was a good time to move on to the actual news. My sister's but ugly face aside, in today's news we'd like to talk about our wicked new security system. That's right, the head of the Midoriya Foundation, Izuka Midoriya, has taken the villain attack on our home very seriously. And has taken the opportunity to vastly improve security while construction was happening. Nara explained as an image of a turret appeared next to her. Turrets and watchtowers have been added in addition to the Grim, and even more is to come thanks to the addition of a new division to the Midoriya Foundation, the Scientific and Research Division. This new division will be led by a former DOC employee, Myru Jikin, Ken explained as a picture of Myru popped up next to him. She doesn't look like much but apparently she's really smart. Suddenly Kay popped up from behind the desk. You could say she's smart as a fox. Ha 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 ha. A laugh track played while Ken and Nara gave very unimpressed looks at the camera, and Kay went back down. Ken sighed. She's like that all the time, help. Back to the topic, we actually have an interview coming up with Jiken later, so stay tuned, Nara said. In other news, the Midoriya Foundation welcomes in four new members. Pictures of Sheena and Nis appeared on the screen. On the right we have Sheena, she is a defector of the Meta Liberation Army. She was unfortunate enough to be born into that group of turds and forced into it by her sucky parents. Ken said, not hiding his disdain. She helped a lot in fighting those loser villains that attacked us, using the attack as a chance to get away from those jerks. Her quirk is called Death's Hand, Nara reported as footage of Sheena using her quirk played over them. It allows her to transform her hands into scythes, and when she cuts something with those scythes she can kill anything. Including parts of them that you can't normally kill. Like the will to fight or your quirk. Yeah, it's a pretty cool quirk, not as cool as ours, but pretty close. The name is way too edgy though. I mean Death's Hand? What is she five? Then again it's better than any name dweeb over here could come up with. Remember when you called Wildvine, Ms. Plant? Guess that was a MS take. Kay popped up once more, and the laugh track played before she sunk back down. Ken and Nara both sighed. You know that was your fault, right? Nara said, glaring at her brother. What? How is that my fault? You're the one who came up with that stupid name. Ken argued. You're the one who brought it up? 
Nara shot back. And like have any right saying anyone's naming skills are bad when you named one of your forms I guy. I guy's a great name. Ken continued. Splash! From off screen, Koda shot two blasts of water at both of their faces. Back on topic. Nara sighed, rubbing her temples. Yes, thank you. Moving on, next we have Nis. Not much is known about her, other than she was found with amnesia. Her quirk is called Vectors. You know Doc October from Spider Man? Ken asked the camera. Basically, her quirk is that, but invisible. Giving her four invisible psychic arms that come out of her back. Moving on, we have two more occupants joining us that you may be familiar with, Nara said before images of Alice and Chol went up on screen. That's right. The sister and niece of the number one American hero stars and stripes. Alice and Chol Bait. Yup. People knew S and S were coming to Japan, but they didn't know why. Well, we'll tell you. Ken announced. It's because her little sister was coming over to accept a job at the Midoriya Foundation. That's right. Ms. Bate will be acting as head secretary for the Midoriya Foundation and looking at the amount of paperwork the director has to deal with, all I can say is, thank you. Nara gave a short bow of appreciation, before continuing. Now you might be wondering, why did they decide to leave their sister's hero agency and come all the way to Japan? And the answer to that is Dash. None of your business. Ken shouted. Anyway, that's all for the new guys. Let's move on to Shiruka with sports, while my sister cleans up her face. Wait what dash, Nara was interrupted, as Ken pulled out a cream pie he was hiding in the desk and threw it at Nara's face, absolutely smoothing her in whipped cream. Ah ha 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 Ken burst out laughing, collapsing over the desk as he descended into a fit. All the while, Nara took a few seconds to process what just happened, before pulling out a thick hardcover book and raising it over Ken's head. The camera cut, just as she was bringing it down. Hello everyone I am Shiruka Midoriya, and I'm here with Kiba Midoriya and Sori Jaga at the tennis field, to watch the most powerful game of tennis to ever be played. Shiruka explained. Behind her was, of course, the tennis court, with Kiba and Sori on both sides. You may have beaten me once before, but this time your queen will prove to be victorious. Kiba shouted at Sori. Sori smirked. I'm looking forward to it Lady Kiba. Come on. Make my body tingle. Let the game begin. Shiruka shouted. Kiba was first, she threw up the ball high into the air, before jumping after it and raising her racket. Slam. Kiba slammed the ball with her reinforced racket, causing it to shoot down towards Sori's side like a meteor. Oh shit. Sori thought, before she leapt into action, literally, she jumped back and leaped into the air, ready to meet the ball. She knew that if she tried to hit the ball, its forward momentum would only bring them both down, so she had to be a bit more creative. With excellent precision, she moved her racket behind the ball as it was rocketing down, before pushing it down, and then deflecting its momentum turning it sideways, causing her to spin around rapidly before eventually, she managed to send the ball back at Kiba. Kiba was too shocked to react in time as the ball flew right past her, hitting the floor as she got ready to move. Curses! Kiba tried to hit her with a super serve, but Sori countered with a spin and earned 15 points. Shiruku announced. It looks like Kiba's not happy about that though, let's see what happens next. TCH. Kiba scowled as she pulled out another ball, the old one having flown off to who knows where. You almost got me with that one lady Kiba. But I was just a little too clever. Sori said, not seeing the irony of that statement. Kiba frowned for a second, before a smirk appeared on her face, as an idea came to her. Oh but I can be clever too. Just watch. Then she quickly threw the ball up and aimed her racket so it would send the ball flying left. Sori saw this and geared her body to start moving left. Only for Kiba to miss, and then quickly change her position, so she hit the ball right with all her might. Shum. The ball went over to the right and Sori's eyes widened, as she quickly tried to shift her body to the other side and run over to it, but it was too late and the ball went rushing past her, hitting the court. Looks like Kiba faked Sori out. Getting her to 15 points. Shiruku announced. Just so you know, this game is up to 30, so each side only needs to score one more time to win. Heh, nice one Lady K, completely took me off guard, Sori smirked as she took out another ball. Now, let's finish this Lady Kiba. Once and for all. I'm ready when you are. Kiba got into a battle stance, ready to hit the ball back. 
Sori got ready to throw the ball up when suddenly shadows started moving over the court. Huh. Why would you look at that? It's time for the weather. Shiruka called. Seems like we're about to have a rain of fireballs coming down. I'd suggest staying inside. Suddenly a crowd of manticores flew over the courtyard and started spitting fireballs down on both sides of the court. Whoa! Sori and Kiba started dodging the fireballs as they were flung down from the sky. Kiba watched as Sori gracefully dodged each fireball. Darn it, she's too good at dodging. At this rate, I won't be able to focus when she throws the ball. I need to slow her down, wait. That might work. Just need to wait for the right moment. After getting used to the new obstacle, Sori finally managed to throw the ball up and got ready to knock it over to Kiba. And in that moment, Kiba stomped the ground, creating cracks and causing the whole ground to shake. As well as messing up Sori's movement a bit. Eck! Sori tripped and barely managed not to fall, but her racket flung forward and hit the ball into Kiba's side of the court. Kiba rushed over and smacked the ball as hard as she could back over to Sori's side. Making sure to avoid the fireballs. Sori was about to hit it back, but her imbalance, combined with trying to dodge the fireballs, caused her to miss the ball as it flew past her and hit the court. And with the shockwave, Kiba wins it. Shiruka said, giving her a short applause as Kiba stood on the field looking proud. Of course I'm victorious. I am the great Kiba Midoriya after all. Ah ha ha ha. Kiba laughed victoriously. Of course, it's unfortunate that she had to mess up the court to do so, but hey, at least dad's not doing the paperwork all alone now. Shiruka pointed out. Kiba suddenly stopped laughing as her eyes opened wide before she looked down at the court, which was now cracked and uneven. Then she looked back up to the sky and screamed. Curses! Well, that's sports. We'll be back to Nara and Ken after these messages. Shiruka said to the camera before it cut off. Please, you are the only one who can save our world. Said a woman's voice over a black screen. Suddenly, it showed a man who looked suspiciously like an adult Ken, floating in what looked like space, in front of a massive goddess that looked suspiciously like an adult Ari. Hero from another world, I summon thee. Said the goddess. Explore a whole new world. Said some words over a black screen. Then it showed the main character, running across various different landscapes, from lush forests and plains to dark shadowy lands, to vibrant oceans, to volcanoes, all rendered beautifully in the best graphics imaginable. Make new friends! Came the words on the black screen again. Since you knew here, I'll be your guide. Said a woman that looked like an adult Fuku. Please rely on me. Time for things to heat up, the camera switched to an adult Netsa-looking character with swords made of fire, getting ready to attack. My magic is unmatched. The camera once again switched, now showing a girl that looked like Nara in a witch outfit. Turn into epic beasts of nature. Said the words over the black screen again. The dragons are said to be the embodiment of this world's elements and the protectors of all. Explained Fuku's character as it showed the Genesis gauntlet, a big golden gauntlet with multiple slots. And with this, you can call upon their power. Embody it. Then, the camera started to show various different parts of a dragon that appeared to be made out of wood and had a glowing green eye and a mane made of vine before showing it off completely. Roar! Fight for the sake of this world! Came the words on the black screen again. The camera now showed an image of a giant black bird covering the world, before it switched to show the already shown characters, fighting monsters in real-time gameplay. Then it switched to a throne room and had the already shown characters in front of an adult Kiba-like character. If you stand in my way. Suddenly, the Kiba-like character opened her eyes revealing them to be a chilling shade of red. Then I will crush you completely. Cut to black, once more, before the name of the game appeared on the screen. Dragon World Omni. That stayed on screen for a few seconds, before some more logos were revealed. One was the logo for Omni Games, and then under that were the logos for the consoles it was going to be on. And then, just as it seemed over, everyone went black again and the voice of Ares' character came up once again. Fear not. You are not the only hero I can summon from other worlds. Then suddenly, cut to a bright light and All Might appearing on screen. I am here. It then showed some footage with All Might as part of the party battling foes for a little bit, before it cuts to a black screen with All Might standing in the back and the words you All Might pre-order bonus. Cut back to Ken and Nara at their news desk, although they looked more disheveled. 
Their suits were torn up, Nara still had some cream in her hair, and Ken had a giant bump on his head, but they acted like nothing was wrong. That's right. The first game from the soon-to-be legendary game developers, Omni Games. Ken said proudly. Led by yours truly. Dragon World Omni is an open-world RPG where you'll gain allies and skills to help save the land from evil, Nara explained. But that's not all, as some of you may have seen, you can summon heroes from our world into the game, including All Might himself. I won't reveal those characters just yet, but I'm sure you'll love being able to have your favorite heroes join your party. And don't worry, while All Might is a pre-order bonus, you can still get him in-game. It'll just take you a bit longer. We've been working super hard on this game, so expect the best. Ken gloated. I mean did you see those graphics? Yeah, yeah, it turns out you're good for something after all. Nara rolled her eyes. Anyway, I think it's about time we moved on to the last part of the report, that interview with Ms. Jicken. Brought to you live by our interviewer, Kay. They cut the camera over to Kay and Myru in a room, with one long couch. On one end was Kay, and the other end was Myru, who was looking exceptionally nervous. Oh. We're on. Hi everyone. Kay waved to the camera, Myru doing the same but very timidly. I'm Kay Midoriya. Here with Myru Jikin for an interview. So let's get an interview of your mind. Ah ha 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 ha. Once again, the canned laugher played at Kay's horrible, horrible jokes. So, then please tell us about yourself, please. I'm sure everyone would love to know more about you. Kay prompted, giving my a bright smile. Oh well. I'm actually an orphan like all of you, or like all of you were. Mais corrected. I don't know what happened to my parents, but I guess it doesn't really matter. I was raised in an orphanage, an actual orphanage, not like this place. It was much much worse, and there wasn't nearly as much to do. You could play with the other kids but well, you see the second tale? It's actually a birth defect. And because of it, all the other kids made fun of me and wouldn't play with me, sometimes they'd tie my tails together for fun. Oh. Some people did that to my snakes too. It was super hard to untie. Kay said, keeping her positive attitude despite the horrible thing she just said. Yeah, definitely. Mai groaned, remembering the literal hours they used to spend untying their tails, as all the hairs got caught together. But, putting that aside, I didn't have all that much to do aside from watch TV. Kay nodded. Did you see something cool on the TV that made you want to learn how to make machines and stuff? Mai chuckled at Kay's comment and her enthusiasm. Well no, but you're kinda close. My interest in machines did come from the TV but not in that way. You see, one day the TV broke. And the orphanage didn't have a whole lot of money, so they weren't getting a new one anytime soon. The other kids just played with each other but as I said, that wasn't really an option for me. And since I had nothing better to do, I decided to try and learn how to fix the TV. And that's when I picked up my interest in machines. I was so confused at first at how everyone worked and fit together, but once I understood it, it was just so amazing to me. And so once I finished fixing the TV, I started experimenting with other things. I started going to the library to learn absolutely everything I could about how things worked, and then later on I'd go to junkyards and try to make things out of the scrap. And I started getting more and more successful, and soon enough I just became obsessed with making, fixing, and discovering things. It became my passion. Wah wah wah. Kay was absorbed by Mai's enthusiasm, absolutely enthralled by the sense of wonder and joy in Mai's eyes as she talked about her passion. That's super amazing. You got that smart by just reading books and practicing. Amazing. You're amazing. Mai turned bright red at that comment and giggled a bit. No, you think so? I was just really determined is all. I'm sure anyone could do it with enough work. Even me? Kay asked. Mai smiled at her. Uh. With enough hard work and determination, I'm sure you could do anything you want, Jay, just so long as it's legal, of course. Kay nodded. Of course. Please get back on script, Kay, Tfu said from off screen. Oh. Ok. Kay said, before pulling out the loose script they'd written and trying to see what the next question she was supposed to ask was. So, what do you plan on doing now that you're the head of the new division? Well, Mr. Midoriya wants us to help make things to defend and assist you guys first and foremost, Mai explained. But aside from that, just some casual research into some interesting topics. Like what is Yami's grim goop? Cool. Are you gonna hire employees? 
I hope you don't plan on doing all the work and almost dying like daddy did. Kay said, giving her a look of concern. No, no, no. I'll hire some employees. Maybe not too many, but just enough to get things done without overworking anyone. Mai answered, before turning sheepish. I uh, actually already hired someone. Oh. Who? 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 Kay asked eagerly. I can't say, Mai explained. If she announced publicly that the first person she hired was her girlfriend then people would be up in arms. But let's just say she's gonna be a big help. I sure hope so. Kay responded. Time's up, we have to finish, Dfu said from off screen. Oh. Kay pouted before looking at the camera. Well, looks like our time is up. Make sure to come back again to see what's news. Ahahahahaha. <laughs> As the laugh track played once more, Fu sighed. Just had to fit one more in. Cutting back to Ken and Nara, Ken was embedded in the wall while Nara was sitting at the desk staring at the camera. Thank you, everyone, for listening to our news broadcast. Nara said, giving a small bow. Please remember to like and subscribe and ring the bell for notification. And make sure to check out Dragon World Omni in the description below. Until time everyone, take care. Am um, I heard people say that the best way to find out if a relationship would work would be for the couple to move in together and see if things went smoothly. So was it wrong to consider it a sign that her time with Yami here had gone so smoothly? Every day was so much fun. They'd play video games, go out and give out candies to the less fortunate, play in the park, and she'd even started learning how to cook, she was terrible at it, but it was a start. It was so great she dreaded the idea of playing video games alone again which is why she was currently sulking at the kitchen table. Because in a few days Yami would be returning home. What's wrong, sunshine? Her mother asked her as she went into the kitchen and saw her daughter with her face on the table. Nothing, Amai said weakly, in a tone that contradicted her words. Oh dear. Her mother pulled up a chair and sat down next to her. Is it because Yami is leaving soon? No. Amai lit. Oh dear, why don't you ask him on a date? Her mother just said outright. I'm not in love with him, mom. Am I denied, not moving an inch? Hmm. Her mother put her hand on her daughter's head. So you don't get excited by the idea of spending a whole day by his side? Holding hands on the beach? Am I blushed because she knew what her mother was doing? She could read emotions, that was her quirk. So the only thing she could do was try not to imagine what her mother had just put in her head and how lovely it would be. And where it could go from there, she was failing miserably in case you couldn't tell. Sunshine, you know you can't hide things like this from me. Her mother told her. And it won't do you any good to hide away your emotions. Bottling them up will only lead to pain. You need to follow your heart. Like I did when I was your age. Mom, I think I'd die of embarrassment if I tried doing what you did. Am um, I said, finally tilting up her head to look at her mother with her very red face. But what if he doesn't like me? What if I make things weird? It's going to be weird no matter what, sweetheart. Her mother said honestly. If you hold it in the whole time, it's going to be weird trying to hide the fact that you have feelings for him while dealing with your unresolved feelings. If you confess and he rejects you, it's gonna be weird because the two of you will have to deal with a one-sided relationship and if he accepts, it's going to be weird because you won't know how to be in a relationship. Ugh hi. Am I groaned, putting her face back on the table. Mom, this isn't helping. Well, dear, that's just how it is. Her mother said honestly. It's going to be rough, but regardless it will get better. If you choose to deal with it. If you just keep pushing it off, then it will stay awkward and hard to deal with. I'm not going to force you, sweetheart, but I strongly recommend you do something about your feelings. Am um, I thought about that for a minute, really letting her mother's words sink in. Okay, just a little further, we've almost finished the raid. Amai was now in gaming mode, sitting in her room was Yami, as the two of them played on separate PCs. The game they were playing was one of Amai's favorite MMO's never-ending Fantasy XIV, which Amai had convinced Yami to play quite some time ago. Amai's character was, of course, a DPS character who specialized in speed and used dual daggers. And Yami's character was a healer. Given how new he was to the game he would normally be rather weak, however, thanks to the legendary item known as, the credit card, he managed to get some equipment that made it so he'd be able to keep up after some intense grinding. 
The two's characters were running along with a large party of people, a mite towards the front close to the tanks, while Yami was in the back with the other healers, behind the mages, archers, and magic gunmen. Good exercise for my fingers, Yami noted as he rapidly healed the party with all of his skills. I know right. Amai agreed, before getting back in the zone as they approached the boss. Okay, Yami we're coming up on the boss so I need you to focus harder than ever before. Hmm, Yami grunted in confirmation before his eyes focused on the screen. The party entered the boss's room and were immediately confronted by the boss, Cliffdrop, a giant golem dragon. Be careful Yami this boss spawns pools of quicksand in whatever spot has the most plays in it, don't just stay in one place, and don't touch the edges of the walls, they're covered in spikes, Amai warned him, getting a small nod in response. The battle raged on, each member of the large party doing their job. Amai was furiously hitting her keyboard. Each second a new skill would refresh, and as such, she needed to press at least three keys per second. Yami remember don't always try to heal, if everyone is above half health, then attack the boss. Okoa. Yami wondered how she could possibly pay attention to both his character and her own while pressing that many keys, but he'd just add that to the list of things about Amai that amazed him. The battle was long because the boss was an absolute damage sponge, but eventually, they got it down to a tenth of its health. Suddenly, a whirlwind of sand surrounded the dragon, damaging everyone who attacked him from close range and nullifying all damage. Oh shoot! Yami get ready he's about to unleash his desperation attack, it'll fill the entire screen and do crazy damage. Amai explained as she got ready to use her skills that would help her survive. The support characters are gonna start buffing you guys and lowering your cooldowns. Start spamming your healing moves like crazy. Got it. Yami shouted as he got ready to mash like never before. The dragon unleashed a massive sandstorm, covering the entire battlefield, and doing lots of damage to everyone on the field. Yami started mashing his healing skills as fast as he could, but he was still new to the game and was being swiftly overwhelmed, unable to press all of them at the same time. Amai could see Yami's health dropping and she knew he was struggling to keep up. He was still a noob after all. I could go help him and leave my character on auto battle, but auto battle is trash. I'm not sure my character will survive if I do that. But then again, this might be my chance to impress him screw it. She pressed the auto battle key, dived over to Yami, and started pressing keys along with him. Come on Yami. Heal. Heal. Yami looked at her shocked for a split second, before continuing to mash keys. With the efforts of the two of them, they managed to hit all the keys, keeping Yami's character alive, as well as helping the healing efforts in general. After a few more seconds, the attack had ended, and most of the players had survived. Amai's character had also survived, but not by much, the AI was mindlessly attacking the boss, using her skills slowly in comparison to how Amai used it, and her character was on the verge of death and was about to feel the wrath of one of the boss's AoE attacks. Seeing the danger, Amai rushed back over to her seat, turned off auto battle, and used her movement skills to get herself out of the way just in time to dodge the A. Oi. Yami then started to focus his efforts on healing Amai. The boss was almost dead, they just needed to last a little bit longer. The next couple minutes were spent nervously attempting to keep Amai's character alive from the brink of death, until eventually. Roarer! The golem dragon let out a death cry, as its health bar had finally reached zero. Cracks formed, and the dragon crumbled, into dust. They had one. Phew! Both Amai and Yami had reeled back, letting out a sigh of relief. Yami had no idea why he felt so exhausted. It was just a game after all, if they failed they could try again. But Amai's desire to win was so intense, that it spilled over to Yami, and he took this much more seriously than he otherwise would have. As the quest ended, and the rewards came in, Amai and Yami turned to each other and raised their arms. Smack! And both of them gave a very, very satisfying high five. The two smiled at each other, which was rare, as Yami was not exactly expressive, but after a while, Yami got up and started stretching. Gonna go get food. Be back. Yami went out of the room, closing the door behind him, leaving Amai with a dumb smile on her face. This was what was so great about gaming with Yami. Being in charge of a team, working together to barely keep each other alive, and then coming out victorious and celebrating at the end. It made her heart beat fast. I strongly recommend you do something about your feelings. Her mother's words rang out in her head, causing her face to turn bright red. Should I ask him on a date? Amai's face turned even redder at the idea. Now she was nervous once again, but for a very different reason. 
There would be no resetting if this went wrong. But if things went well, could she be even happier than this? The idea was just so, so tempting. Then the door opened and Yami came back, holding two cans of gamer fuel and one big bag of chips. Back. Oh, H. Hey. Am um, I said, trying to bring her thoughts together so she could speak coherently. Thanks for the snacks. I really need it. Hey, hey. Why are you nervous? Yami asked, of course being able to see her emotions. Ah. Uh. This was the downside of having a crush who could see your emotions but somehow still didn't find out you had a crush on them. They could see through you just enough to make you have to explain yourself, but not enough to just figure you out and get the ordeal over with. I am wanted to ask you a question. Okay. Do it, Ayami told her. He'd told her not to be afraid to ask him anything and he meant that. Oh. Um. Am I bit her lip nervously as she tried to muster up her courage. I was wondering if you'd like to dash. Ring. 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 Just then, Yami's phone started to ring in his pants. Yami raised up his finger, indicating for her to give him a second, before pulling it out and answering. Hmm. What cliché timing. Am I thought to herself as she watched Yami listen to whoever it was calling him over the phone. After a few minutes, Yami finally responded. Okay, I'll tell her soon, goodbye. And with that, the conversation ended and Yami put his phone back in his pocket. What was that about? Amai asked, her curiosity overtaking her other feelings at the moment. They're starting something called, Minecraft server, Yami explained. Want us to join? Oh, a group Minecraft server. I've always wanted to be part of one of those. Amai had seen many, many videos of people on group Minecraft servers, and it looked like a ton of fun. I'd love to join. If they can handle me, that is. Hmm. <laughs> Yami nodded. Okay, what do you want to ask? Um, I was wondering if... Um, I could feel herself losing her nerve. It was now or never. If you'd like to share a Minecraft house with me? Yami stared at her blankly for a second before shrugging. Okowo. Eh, hi. Um, I screamed in her head, but she forced herself to smile. T thanks. Why don't we log on to the server and start building? What did I just say? Am um, I screamed in her head. Why did those words come out of my mouth? Out of all the things I could have said. To Amai, this was the worst possible thing she could have asked. Because to a normal person, this meant pretty much nothing. But to a gamer, sharing a Minecraft house symbolized some kind of relationship, usually romantic. She's somehow been both over romantic and not romantic enough, and now she couldn't back out without looking weird. Why are you still nervous? Yami asked, confused as to why she'd still be nervous if he already said yes to her question. Oh um, I just really want to make the best house possible. Am I lit? Fortunately, she was too nervous to feel guilty about lying to him, so Yami didn't notice. We will, Yami assured her. You're best at games. So no problem. Amai's face somehow got even redder, and she quickly went over to the TV. Thank you now let's start now please. Wow. Myru looked up at her new lab, with Uchi by her side. The lab was a three-story high, white building that stretched over the length of two football fields, not including the two levels that went underground and stretched on even further. It's amazing, Aachi whispered in amazement. I want to make sure that my employees work in the best conditions and have everything they'll need, Izuku said from behind them. Thank you, Mr. Midoriya, sir. Mai turned around and bowed to him. I really don't have the words to express how grateful I am. Then use actions, Izuku told her. Like I said, I don't care what you do here, who you hire, or what you research, just so long as you as make me what I ask. Research what I ask. Do your best not to hurt anyone, including yourselves and your staff. And of course, do nothing illegal. Of course, sir. It's our honor to take on such a responsibility, and we will do our best not to disappoint. Uchi said, bowing to him alongside her girlfriend. Izuku pulled out a paper and handed it over to Mai. This is your yearly budget. I'm not saying I won't let you go over it but it would have to be for a very good reason. It may raise if we earn more income. Mai unfolded the paper and when she looked at the number, her eyes went wide. Oh wow. Achi took a look at it as well and had a similar reaction. Oh my. Izuka smiled at that reaction. Hopefully, that means they won't be going over budget anytime soon. Well, I'll let you two get settled in, Izuka said as he started walking away. 
I have to go receive two children. Izuka waited in front of the house for Yami and Jin to arrive. He'd instructed the DOC agents to pick up Yami on their way to save Amai's family the trouble. After some time passed, finally, he got a notification that the car was approaching the gates. He opened them with his phone and allowed them inside. The car drove up, around the tree, and to the front of the house, before stopping. Immediately, the back door opened up and Yami came out, walking right up to Izuku. Izuku smiled and leaned down, scoping Yami up in his arms, happy to see a small smile on Yami's face as well. Hey there Yami how was it? Good. It was fun. Got lots of energy. Yami explained, giving Izuku a quick hug. I'm glad. On both accounts. Izuku said, putting him down before nuzzling his hair. Sir, Tsai said as she exited the passenger seat. Bura, thank you for keeping him safe, Izuku said, giving her a short bow. I'm just doing my job sir, but thank you, Tsai said, smiling at her boss's gratitude. Yon. At the sound of a yawn, they all looked back at the car and saw Jin stumble out of the car, wearing purple pajamas and a harness on his chest, containing a mostly empty fractal which was currently absorbing the radiation he was emitting. Jin rubbed his eyes as he slowly walked toward them. After a couple of seconds, he reached them and then looked up at Izuku, finally fully opening his eyes, inspecting the green teen for a while. You're my new caretaker or something? Yep. My name is Midoriya Izuku. It's nice to meet you. Izuka kneeled down and extended a hand for him to shake. Jin curtly shook his hand before yawning again. E. I'm Dim. Can I go to my room now? Of course. Do you want me to carry you? Izuku asked him. So long as Jin had a fractal on him, his radiation wasn't dangerous, so he was safe to touch. Please. Jin said, raising his arms up, allowing Izuku to pick him up and carry him away. Yami, feel free to do whatever you'd like for now. I'll talk to you later. Izuka told him, receiving a thumbs up from Yami, as Sai picked up his things, and they all headed into the house. Izuka reached Jin's room rather fast. Like Fuku and Niz, Jin's room had a metal door, to make sure the radiation didn't leak out. Izuku opened the door and carried Jin into the room. It was a rather simple room, as most rooms started. The only special detail was that the floor had very tiny holes in it. One of the reasons it took so long for this room to get made was because of this floor. It was designed to suck the chaos energy that radiated off of Jin and tunnel it over to the laboratory. There was also a closet full of empty fractals and harnesses for when he left the room. Jin looked around for a few seconds before grunting. Looks good. You can let me down now. Izuka set the boy down on his feet, where he promptly walked over to the bed, got under the sheets, and before Izuka could say anything he fell asleep. He had expected this thought. Due to his birth defect, Jin's quirk was constantly active on a low level which had, unfortunately, had the side of effect of leaving him almost constantly drained and out of energy. This meant that Jin spent most of his day asleep, and when he was awake, he typically didn't move around a whole lot. Well, hopefully, this means I don't have to worry about him getting into trouble. Izuka sighed. Izuku, Yami, and Sori went into the forest, ready for yet another demonstration of the new Grim. So why'd you call me for this kiddo? Sori asked the pale boy curiously. Wanted to see if you could beat New Grim, Yami explained. Made it to beat you. Oh? Now you're getting me excited. Sori grinned before cracking her knuckles. Eventually, they reached an opening big enough for the display. All right, kid, show me what you got. Sori went over to the center of the clearing and got in a battle pose. Yami then started barfing up his grim goop until it made a very, very large puddle. After a few seconds, the goop started to rise and take form until it took the shape of seven new grim. These grim were very tall, lanky humanoids with skull-like faces that emitted a red glow from their face and eyes. Its entire body was skinny and skeleton-like. It had extremely long arms, but no hands, rather its arms just split into two very long thin fingers. With claws on the end, the thing was even more nightmarish than a normal Grim. Oh. Scary. Sori commented, not sounding scared at all. They look pretty scrawny if you ask me. Hmm. Was Yami's response as he silently ordered the seven Grim to surround her. So, what do these do? Izuku asked. Watch, Yami instructed, before giving his next command. Attack. Rahai. 
The seven Grimm screeched so loudly it rang throughout the forest, causing all the humans around them to cover their ears. However, this did stun Sori for a second before she regained her composure. Fortunately, while the Grimm were advancing on her, they were very, very slow. They moved even slower than a normal human walking. Gonna have to use more than just loud noises to beat me, kid. Sori shouted before she dashed over to the closest Grimm and thrust her claw forward, right at its throat. Only for it to bounce off its neck, leaving a very small cut. Realizing that these things were much tankier than they looked, Sori switched her tactics from one-shot kills to rapid strikes. Sori unleashed a rapid stream of claw slashes at the creature's neck, digging deeper and deeper into its throat, but something was off. Her eyes widened and she jumped over the monster, away from the grim, and looked at herself. Something's off, why does my body seem so heavy? It wasn't like her body was physically heavier, it was more like she was being drained of energy. Is that what these things do? Sori thought to herself. Crap, I need to fight these things without touching them, how do I do that? As she was thinking, the Grim raised up their arms and they extended out towards her. Shit! She thought as she dodged to the left and started running to avoid their extended arms as they followed her. For a while, this continued. Sori continuing to move and dodge away from the Grim easily, but unable to actually attack them. Eventually, though, Sori got tired of this and scowled at the Grim. Fuck it! Sori dug her claws into the ground and lunged at the Grim at full speed, tackling it to the ground. She sat atop the monster and unleashed a flurry of claw strikes at its head and neck. After what felt like a hundred attacks, Sori finally ripped the thing's neck open. The creature let out a silent roar as it started to fade and die. But this did little for Sori who felt absolutely drained. She really, really didn't want to move anymore. And to make it worse, the other creatures extended their arms and grabbed various parts of her body. At first, Sori wanted to slash them off of her, but that sounded like so much work. Ugh. All Sori could muster was some weak slashes, which did approximately nothing. As the creatures descended on her, Sori just couldn't muster the energy to move or to even care. Why fight back, these things wouldn't kill her after all. She just had to call out and it would be over. But that sounded exhausting too, why do any of that, when she could just lay down and do nothing? And so as the monsters stood over her, Sori just laid down and did nothing. Enough. Get off. Yami ordered. The Grim obeyed, taking their hands off of Sori and backing away. Izuka ran over to Sori who was still laying down, staring at the sky. Are you okay? Dino. Sori's voice was almost monotone, she didn't even bother to tilt her head to look at Izuku. Hey, boss could you just leave me here? I don't feel like moving or talking or doing anything really. Izuka turned to Yami. Yami, what did these things do to her? And can you undo it? They drain willpower when touched, Yami explained simply. Very sturdy. Hard to kill. She be okay in few hours. Okay, I see. Izuku put his hand to his chin and started thinking. On the one hand, this could be very effective. They managed to beat Sori after all, and she powered through literally every other grim Yami had made. But on the other hand, these things were extremely slow. Izuka could probably escape from them without much help. So unless the intruders stopped to try and fight these things, they wouldn't be super useful, at least not in small numbers. If he had large groups of these things placed in strategic locations, they could be very effective at stopping intruders or at least slowing them down. Then there was also the issue that seemed a little inhumane. Sure the effects wore off, but Izuku had been in the position of having little to no willpower, and it was severely unpleasant, to say the least. Still, if they could help him protect the children, then he didn't have much choice, did he? Not with the MLA out for his blood and his children. Well, we'll talk about how these will be put into the defense later, for now, make something to pick up Sori, and then let's go back. So we can have your welcome feast. Izuka told him with a smile. Eh. Izuka let out a pleased sigh as he lay in bed. Overall, things had gone well today. There had been no issues with the lab. Yami and Jin got here safely. Yami made a new powerful Grim, and Sori had recovered well from the effects of the new Grim. Which Kiba had called the apathy. Sori had taken care of most of the paperwork today, meaning Izuku actually got to spend time with the kids. Things were looking up. Now his priorities were hiring more personnel, namely a nurse, and getting Yami to spit out some more grim to get their defense back in full force. He also had another session with Rin soon, meaning he would be getting further along in their test. 
As Izuka laid down, closed his eyes, and got ready to go to sleep. Ding! Izuka sighed as he opened his eyes back up and picked himself up so he could look at his phone on his nightstand. It was a couple of texts from Tsuma. The first one was a photo of herself in a bar with a very large blonde woman. That by itself was good, Tsuma was already getting out there and interacting with people. But it was her second text that interested him more. I may have found you a nurse. It read. Izuka felt like an idoid. He had the head of several hospitals in his department and he didn't think to ask her if he could get his hands on a doctor or something. Ding. Another text. It read, she's willing to do a psych probe. She's rather desperate for a job because her method of healing while effective is rather unorthodox. I very much doubt she's a secret assassin, but you can test her any way you want. Well. That's a good sign. Izuka thought as he texted back. Thank you for the help. And I'm glad you're getting more social. You'll have your pictures shortly. Give that person my contact information. Izuka texted. After that, Izuka quickly texted Suma about 10 pictures of Eri he had on hand before putting his phone down. Once more, Izuka laid down with a smile on his face. After so much work and so many setbacks, things were finally looking bright once more. Seems like the period of hardship would soon come to an end. Vyarararararar. Ugh, Dizuka grunted as he picked himself back up, flipped his phone over, and looked at who the heck was calling him now. And when he saw the name on the caller's ID he froze. Vyarararararar. Vyarararararar. Izuka just looked at the phone as it vibrated, unsure what to do. Part of him wanted to ignore it and just go back to sleep. But he was too curious and cautious. He had no idea what this was about after all. And it would have to be a pretty serious situation if his father was calling him after all this time. Are you okay? Ren and Izuka were in Izuka's office, sitting on opposite couches once more. Honestly no, but I don't want to talk about it right now, Izuka sighed as he started chugging his coffee. You do realize this is therapy right? Ren asked, taking a sip of his own coffee. I'll talk about it eventually just, please not right now, Izuka begged. It's fine, I'm not gonna force the matter, just wanted to remind you that this is a good place to get things off your chest, Run told him. Thank you, I'll touch on this one day, just today, Izuka said, before finishing his decaf coffee. Shall we get to the point? If that's what you want. Run took a few seconds to finish his own decaf coffee. Then let's go. Entering the velvet room, now that he knew what was happening, was a rather pleasant sensation. He awoke at the bar, facing Lavenza who quickly gave him a polite bow. It's a pleasure to see you again Mr. Midoriya, Lavenza told him. When we heard of the attack on your home, I was worried for your health. But it appears you are mostly intact. Although the stress seems to be negatively affecting you once more. But you seem to be handling it better than before. Thank you, and I appreciate the concern. Izuka bowed back. I'm just glad we got through it all without anyone being killed. Things like that make me wish I could use my fighting abilities in the real world. Rain sighed. Same. Izuka chuckled. How useful Heracles would have been during that attack. Speaking of which, sorry for not staying longer Lavenza, but I really would like to get to the palace. It's fine. There are many people who are more eager to get into the palace after their first experience. Lavenza explained, before motioning to the back door. The palace is ready. Please remember not to rush through it. Even though this method healing takes time. Izuku nodded. Right. Thank you. Izuku and Ren were back in front of Aldria and quickly entered through the gates. All the shadows surrounding them on the outside avoid them. Now that they know we can fight back, it seems the ones outside won't touch us, Ren noted as they strolled up to the school. Typical of bullies. Without the teachers covering for them, they don't have any protection. Izuka sighed. As if only it was that simple in real life, then again I never really tried to stick up for myself back then. The two of them arrived at the front doors and took a moment to stop. Well, it's time to fix that, Ren told him. Are you ready? No, Githukwan Serdanistli. If he had it his way, he'd never enter through those doors again. But he needed to confront his trauma if he was ever going to move past it. But let's get this over with anyway. Ren and Izuku put their hands on the door and pushed it open before entering inside. Slam! The moment they went inside, the doors slammed behind them with an almost deafening sound. Ren turned around and tried to pull the door open with a tug. 
Looks like we can't go back through there. You said this place worked based on cognition, right? Izuka recalled. Whenever I was here, I always felt like I was trapped here until school let out. So I guess that means we're stuck for six hours. Perhaps, Ren said, turning back towards the school hallway. But just in case we should keep looking for exits. Until then, stay on guard. All right. Izuku agreed as the two made their way deeper into the school. You said we were looking for my shadow, so where would it be? I don't know, you tell me, Aran said. It's your past and your cognition. Right. Izuku started thinking as they turned around the corner in the hall. And that would likely be Dash. Deku. Izuku froze as a familiar voice made itself known. They both looked down the hall and saw Bakugo Katsuki charging toward them, but this wasn't the real Bakugo obviously, it was a cognitive Bakugo, based on Izuka's view of Bakugo from back then. Naturally, this led to this Bakugo looking more intimidating than normal. His eyes were pure red, and explosions danced on his palms, constantly. He was also way taller than the real Bakugo, standing tall over both Run and Izuku. This was the guy you thought would make a good hero? Ren asked Izuku. He doesn't look like this in real life. Izuka defended. He himself was surprised by how Bakugo looked in his cognition. Considering that he didn't view Bakugo as a bad guy by any means. Then again, he always knew to fear Bakugo whenever he saw him at school, so perhaps this made sense. I heard you caused quite a ruckus out there, Deku. Cognitive Bakugo laughed, before charging at them. Guess I need to put you back in your place. Boom. Cognitive Bakugo used his explosions and blasted himself toward the two of them. Izuka froze. He wasn't scared of real-life Bakugo, because he knew if the blonde did anything to him, that would be the end of his hero career. That was not the case for cognitive Bakugo, and now he was starting to feel like he really was in Aldria again. Fortunately, Run was there and managed to react in time. Persona. Arsen came out and shot a ball of black fire at cognitive Bakugo. Cognitive Bakugo charged through the fireball and took no damage as he made his way toward them at an alarming rate. Shit. Rin cursed as he and Izuka dodged to the side. Kaboom! Cognitive Bakugo hit the wall, causing it to explode, sending Ren and Izuka rolling away across the ground. Ak, Izuka grunted in pain as he and Rin stood back up, while Cognitive Bakugo walked out of the hole he created in the wall and stared the two of them down. Rin summoned a handgun and started opening fire on Cognitive Bakugo. The bullets bounced off Bakugo's skin, doing absolutely nothing to him. Heracles! Izuka shouted out, summoning Heracles behind him, who then rushed at Bakugo in order to attack him. Heracles raised his weapon to strike Cognitive Bakugo, only for Cognitive Bakugo to fire off two massive explosions at Heracles, engulfing the persona entirely. The muscled persona was launched back and Ren barely managed to pull Izuku out of the way to keep Heracles from crushing him. Heracles hit the school door and slumped against it before vanishing. All right, I'd say that's our cue to leave, Ren said. How? My cognition won't let us leave? Izuku asked a bit freaked out that cognitive Bakugo seemed to be invincible. True, but what do you think is stronger? However, there's such thing as a cognitive contradiction. Ren explained as he got into the middle of the hall. Watch. Hey, super pissed Pomeranian. Come and get me. What was that? Cognitive Bakugo shouted as he emerged from the smoke, staring right at Ren. I'll kill you. With that, Ren started running towards the door, and Cognitive Bakugo unleashed another explosion behind him to launch himself at Ren. Ren was a few feet from the door when Cognitive Bakugo caught up, but just when Cognitive Bakugo was raising his hand forward to unleash another explosion, Ren summoned Arsen. Kaboom! Cognitive Bakugo unleashed a massive explosion from his hand that blew through the door, tearing the doors off their hinges and sending Ren flying through the opening. Run flew through the air, as bits of the barrier he had summoned at the last minute floated around him before vanishing completely. The therapist flipped through the air in an overly flashy style, before landing on his feet. It worked! Izuka gasped, looking at the now open entrance slash exit. A cognitive contradiction, I guess my idea of the school being unescapable clashed with my idea of Bakugo being strong. I guess Bakugo couldn't be strong if he couldn't destroy a door. Come back here you bastard! Cognitive Bakugo fired an explosion at Run, who dodged by jumping back. Midoriya it's time we took out leave don't you think? Run took out a grappling hook and shot it at Cognitive Bakugo. 
The hook wrapped around cognitive Bakugo, and Run flung him to the left, sending him into the air and out of Azuka's way. Jarrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrr
It seems as if Yami's quirk has no limit to what he can create, so long as he has enough negative energy. My first question when studying the Grimm is, what is negative energy truly composed of? Unfortunately, I can't simply take a sample of its skin or anything, as whenever a Grimm is killed or a piece of them is cut off, it turns into this kind of black smoke, before disappearing completely. So I have to study a live Grimm. Well, not live per se, because Grimm, while they do mimic living things, aren't alive themselves. They have no will of their own, and can be affected by quirks that don't affect living things. Back to the main topic. Under careful analysis, it seems that Grimm are rather unstable creatures structurally. While they look perfectly solid, they appear to actually be wanting to turn into a gas and are being forced into this solid state by some kind of internal power. This would explain why the Grimm immediately turn into gas after they die. As for where the gas goes after it vanishes, so far I haven't been able to find any conclusive answers to this question, however, I do have a theory. Emotions are considered non-tangible things, however, there are several quirks that can be affected by emotions, proving that emotions are in fact some form of a tangible thing, just not in a conventional matter. It's like they exist in their own world. And believe that once this negative energy is free from the grasp of Yami's quirk, it returns to its own world. Or perhaps I'm overthinking it and it simply fades from existence. I'll try and figure out more about that later. Now, onto the exciting part. That energy I mentioned that's keeping these things together, it's chaos energy. Not the same kind of chaos energy that Jin gives off. But it's the same energy at its core. It's just altered in some way. My speculation is that chaos energy when placed in a human body can be altered by that person's genetics, resulting in the system of quirks we have now. But once again, that's only a theory. But enough theories time for testing. Now how am I going to test these you ask? Well, that's simple. I'm gonna stab them with stuff and see what happens. He 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 seriously thought that is what I'm going to do. I'm going to stab each current variant of Grimm with one of three things. The first will be an empty fractal and the next will be a full fractal. And the last will be a chaos emerald. I will be documenting how each Grimm reacts to each. Let's see how it goes. Okay, I was planning to make a log documenting the test results for each Grimm, however the results among pretty much all the Grimm were the same, except for some notable exceptions. First things first, the results for the empty fractal were the same amongst all Grimm. After injection, the Grimm would soon begin to die. And not because it was stabbed. All areas that were stabbed were non-lethal areas, so stabbing them there shouldn't have killed them. At least that's what I thought. As it turns out, the empty fractals were able to suck out the chaos energy that was lying within the Grimm. This is a massive discovery, and the implications are enormous. Would you get similar results if you stabbed other quirk creations? Or even a person? Of course, I'm not gonna stab someone and see what happens, but I'll have to find another way of testing this. But back to my current experiment, the chaos energy gained from the Grimm was a far smaller amount compared to what we get from Jin. It took several Grimm to fill up a single fractal, but once we did, instead of glowing vibrantly in a rainbow-like fashion, the crystal instead turned black and when the Grimm eventually died, they didn't turn into smoke like they normally do. I suspect that the fractal absorbed not just the chaos energy, but the negative energy attached to it. For now, I'll refer to these as black fractals. I have no idea what would happen if one were to try and use a black fractal like they would a normal one, but given they probably have negative emotions sealed into them. I'll have to find a safe way to test that. But for now, I'm putting away all seven black fractals in deep storage. It's best these aren't touched anytime soon. Anyway, onto the full fractals. Mostly the same thing happened whenever I inserted a full fractal into a Grim. They exploded. At first I wasn't fully sure why this happened. I thought either A, the two different types of chaos energy might conflict with each other, or B, the Grim's bodies couldn't handle the added amount of chaos energy, and thus exploded. Turns out, it was B. Grimm's bodies were made to hold a very specific amount of chaos energy. When you flood their bodies with even a little bit more. Well, you get the point. This unfortunately also caused the fractals to explode as well. Which was unfortunate, both because we lost a fractal and because I almost died. FYI, we will not be going through the chaos emerald tests, as if those were to explode, it would likely kill everyone at the Midoriya Foundation and probably most of the city. So as you can see, most of the results were the same across all Grimm. Except for the Hound. When I inserted the full fractal into the Hound, it reacted much different than the other Grimm. It just kinda melted. 
It melted into a black and white puddle. Neither the fractal nor the brain that was inside the hound was found. This is interesting, but I'll be honest, I had no idea why that happened. I scanned the goo afterward, and interestingly enough I found both more chaos energy that hound initially possessed and brain waves. Meaning it was still, well not alive but online I guess? It didn't end up like the other grim is my point. I think that this the hound's way of adapting to the excess chaos energy that was flooding its systems. It's possible it even used the chaos energy to help further its transformation. Although, this seems to have rendered the hound immobile. As it won't move even when ordered to. I'll research this further at a later time. For now, the former hound will be placed in a container and put into storage. And that brings us to the conclusion of this experiment. While I did get interesting results, it seems that for the time being, chaos energy cannot be used to improve the performance of Grimm. At least not right now. I'll be sure to check this again later, once I learn more about chaos energy. Well, on the bright side, even if we can't augment Grimm with chaos energy, we can still use more ordinary methods. And by that, I mean mechanical augmentation. Although even that is rather difficult. Many Grimm either won't benefit from it or just can't handle having any augmentations made. For various reasons. But for now, let's focus on what I can do. Instead of what I can't. After all, I need to show Mr. Midoriya some results. First of all for the Beowulfs, I'm designing some new armor for them. These will help reinforce their unarmored parts, especially their necks, as well as increase the effectiveness of their claws. It's a simple upgrade, but an effective one. Next we have the Ursa. I can't do much with these on account of their weight, but I can give them some light armor. Beringles are similar but I can't even do that, as they have far more mobility than the Ursa, and giving it too much armor will heavily affect that. All I can really do is add some neck armor. Borbatusks are more fun. I'm developing armor for its exposed underside, as well as along its exposed spine. This armor will turn its rolling attack into a sawblade attack. Making it much more effective. Goliaths are even better. Due to their strength and size, I can make quite a few adjustments without affecting their overall abilities. For one guns. I've decided to attach two turret guns to each side of the Goliath. These will of course be controlled by the security center. I've also noticed a big weakness of the Goliath, if you get on its back there's not much it can do. As such I've decided to add a large metal plate to its back. If it detects someone trying to get on top of it while the foundation is in emergency mode, it will electrocute them. The amount of electricity doled out won't affect the Goliath much, but the same probably can't be said for whoever is attacking. Griffins are also a pain because they have to fly so again can't augment them too much. Some lightweight armor and that's it. The Naklavi, oh I got that on the first try. The Naklavi is once again something I can't do much with. Some light armor to the horse's neck and a third metal claw on its hand things. And lastly the wyvern. You'd think this would be another case like the Goliath but nope. It has to fly so I can't add too much weight. But at least I can add some heavier armor. For now that's the only thing I can do. I'm going to ask Mr. Midoriya for permission to create a grim cyberization facility and then see what I can do from there. Until then, that's it for Project Reaper. Okay I know I said that was it for Project Reaper, but I just thought of something. What if irradiated the grim goo in its purest form? Grim once they take physical form, can't handle additional chaos energy, but perhaps in this liquid form, something will happen. I really don't know what to expect here. But hopefully it'll be useful. Right now, we have a tube, which sucks the chaos energy from Jin's room, and brings it over to the fractals. My plan is to run the chaos energy through the goop and see what happens. Be back when I have results. Okay results came quicker than expected. After about 48 hours of irradiation, the goo has undergone significant changes. And by that I mean it's still mostly black, but with a glowing green core. Small problem though. I was curious to see what Yami could create with this new goo, only to find Yami was no longer able to create anything with this. I have no idea what I'm gonna do with this now. So I'm just gonna inject some grim with it and see what happens. This time I'll be more cautious in case of explosions. Okay good news. No explosions. So injected some creeps and beowulfs with the new goop, and uh, their bones started glowing green. At the very least they don't seem to have been affected much other than that. I'm gonna run some tests and see what happens. Okay never mind they do in fact explode. But this time that's a good thing. 
You see, upon further inspection, I found that thanks to the added mass of the goo, the Grim were able to withstand the added chaos energy. But only barely. When the Grim's physical form is sufficiently disrupted, the chaos energy will become unstable and explode. Or in simpler terms, when they die, they explode. This could be very useful for some of the lesser Grim that normally wouldn't be able to do much to stronger opponents. I'll talk to Mr. Midoriya about this later. For now, I'll call this project a success. Log. Project Reaper on hold. New project added. Project named. Project Seven Shadows. New project added. Project named. Project Eraserhead. New project added. Project named. Project Luit Chaos. Current projects. Project Reaper. Project Seed. Project Chaos Control. Project Seven Shadows. Project Eraserhead. Project Luit Chaos. Izuka didn't know what to think about this new nurse candidate that Suma suggested. Vera Nikitina was a 25 year old Russian woman who came to Japan because she was having trouble finding work in the medical field. This was because she was adamant that she should use be allowed to use her quirk, as it was very effective in healing people. And to her credit it was, it was also very easy to see why no hospital would want her to use it. Vera's quirk was called reverse action. It allowed her to take an action she performed, and in turn it into a reverse action, in other words, the action would do the opposite of what it was supposed to. In other words, she healed people, by doing things that normally do the opposite of healing. So her medical tools weren't so much scalpels, bandages, and the like. Rather she used guns, hammers, and flamethrowers. Obviously, hospitals wouldn't want such things around, but given that his children were far more dangerous than any sort of conventional weapon, Izuka didn't care all too much, if it weren't for the fact that he was currently the target of assassination. Now, on one hand, the woman has undergone has a physic probe, so he was as sure as he could possibly be that she wasn't an assassin, but, in the off chance that she somehow managed to trick the test, he'd literally be giving the opportunity to fire lethal weapons at him. The only thing she'd have to do was not use her quirk on him while healing him. But Azuka did feel bad for the woman. If he denied her a job here, chances were slim she would find a job anywhere else, at least in the medical field. Which she was clearly desperate to do, considering she jumped countries to look for work. And Izuku so Izuku's paranoia was battling his desire to help people. However given that it's Izuku, one can guess which one out. And that's what led Izuku to be face to face with the woman in his office. Izuku was of course sitting at his desk while Vera sat opposite to him. Vera was a very large woman, standing almost seven feet tall and with a body not dissimilar to Star and Stripes. She had long blonde hair going down her back, and bright green eyes that stared at him intensely. Thank you for the opportunity Mr. Midoriya. Vera said, her voice definitely had a thick Russian accent to it, although her Japanese was perfectly fine, although even without the accent you'd be able to tell she was a foreigner just by how loud and boisterous her voice was. And thank you for coming in, Ms. Nikitina, Izuka said politely, as he nervously shuffled in his seat. Now, I don't want to waste your time, so I'll get right to the point. I understand why you want to work here, but I want to know, why do you want to work in the medical field so much? Well, when I was a little girl, I got very, very sick once. It was terrible. I couldn't get out of bed for more than 10 minutes, I was in constant pain, and I was convinced I was going to die. Vera explained with a look of disdain. This sickness lasted for a whole year. It was hell. Ever since then, I've always hated illness and sickness. So when I learned that I could get rid of illness and injuries by attacking them with weapons, I knew that this is was my calling. I see. Izuka nodded. So you want to be a medic not because you want to heal people, but because you hate the concept of injuries and illness? Yes. Vera answered strongly with a nod. Hmm. Izuka thought to himself. Well, that's a unique motivation. If they were gonna send an assassin, they probably would say something like they just want to heal children or something nice sounding. This feels too genuine to be fake. Okay. Well, I know you're good at healing, but how clean do you keep your workplace and tools? Izuku asked. If you're hired here, you will be expected to keep everything as clean as possible. Of course. Dirtiness brings illness. So I always make sure to keep everything as clean and tidy. Spotless. Here take a look. Vera then pulled out her phone and showed Izuku a picture of an apartment, presumably hers, it was a very cheap place, but it was surprisingly clean given how places like that normally looked. This my current home. 
Of course, money is tight so it's not very good, but I keep it in the best condition. I see. That's very encouraging. Izuka noted as he looked her over, noting her very clean appearance, her white shirt and jeans, while cheap, were very clean. Spotless even. All right, well how are you with children? Obviously, as this is a childcare facility, you will be dealing with children on a daily basis. Vera winced a bit. I do quite like children, however the same cannot be said in reverse. I hate seeing sick and injured children, so I can't help myself but to want to heal them with my quirk, this has gotten me in much trouble. I'm quite lucky I have not ended up in prison. Ok. Izuka was surprised anyone would say that during an interview, but somehow that made Izuka trust her more. Well given the kind of children we house here, I don't think that will be much of an issue. Speaking of which. This is a very dangerous work environment. The children here have powerful and deadly quirks, which they can have a hard time keeping control of. Not to mention, I'm currently the target of a very powerful villain organization. Of course, we're doing everything we can to make things as safe as possible, but I cannot guarantee your physical or mental safety. Vera shrugged. That is fine. After all, if I don't get this job, I will be broke. I assure you being out of money is far more terrifying than quirks or villains. Fair enough. Izuku had heard similar lines from Achiko. And I have to ask, do you have any combat skills or experience? It's not necessary given your job, but it would help, given the situation I'm in. Hmm. I am not experienced in battle, but I'm trained in using various weapons. Vera explained. Although I dislike bringing harm on other people, I will if need be. That's more than good enough I suppose, Izuka noted. He then went silent for a while as he considered everything that was said. All right, well I think with all things considered, I have no reason not to hire you. Aha. This is great news. Thank you so much, kind child. I will serve you well. Vera sat up and raised her arms in celebration. Knock knock. Hello father may I come in? Asked Yanda on the opposite side of the door. It's important. Izuku immediately grew suspicious. We'll see. Come in. Yanda came in, and immediately Izuku was filled with panic, as he saw her forehead was bleeding. What hap, before Izuku could finish his thought, or Yanda could get a word in, Vera took action. Vera shot up from her seat, grabbed that seat, and rushed over to Yanda in the blink of an eye. Smash! The soon-to-be nurse then raised the chair over her head and smashed it over Yanda's head hard. Both Yanda and Izuku flinched at first, and their eyes widened with fear and surprise, as that was the normal reaction. However swiftly this reaction faded, as Yanda realized a few things rather quickly. 1. She didn't feel like she'd been hit. Like at all. The impact had actually felt rather pleasant, like getting cool after working on a hot day kind of pleasant. And the aching of her head had vanished completely. In the fact, the wound had vanished completely. Izuka calmed down quickly, as he realized he'd just seen her quirk in action. There we go. Good as new. Vera said as she put down her chair, which was completely undamaged. Huh. Yanda was very much not expecting that. She had heard that Izuka was hiring a medic and thus decided to test her, by injuring herself. Well, that was interesting. Thank you? Yes, thank you very much for that, Izuka said after regaining his composure. I see your quirk is as effective as I've been told. Yanda, you're grounded for the rest of the day. I know that wasn't an accident. Izuka thought. You figured you'd see through that. Fair enough. Nice to meet you, new employee. Yanda said as she took her leave. Izuka sighed as Yanda left. Be wary of her, she's problematic. Yes, yes you told me. Dangerous quirks, hard to control. Vera said. No, she's dangerous because of her personality. Although her quirk is to blame for that mostly. Izuka sighed. She is a little girl? How much harm can she do? Vera asked. Hey Eurarika, I wanted to talk to you. Achiko sighed, the last thing she wanted when coming out of the girls' locker room was to be confronted by Mineta. At the very least he didn't attempt to enter while she changed, in fact, he'd been strangely restrained for a while now. No perving that they knew of and a lot less creepy looks. Maybe that's why Achiko decided to entertain him this time and stop. She looked down and was shocked to see Mineta looking up at her with concern and he was looking at her eyes instead of her bust. I, uh, I just wanted to ask if you were okay after seeing that. Mineta asked sympathetically. 
After seeing what? Achiko asked confused at his question, causing Mineta's eyes to widen. You didn't see it. It's gone viral. Mineta quickly pulled out his phone and quickly showed a new video on YouTube. One of Midoriya and Bakugo's old classmates just spilled the beans. Achiko watched closely as the video started showing Bakugo and Izuku in a classroom at their old middle school. Deki you fucking pathetic waste of space. You think a shithead like you could ever get into UA? Past Bakugo shouted over the phone while exploding Izuka's desk while the green teen trembled in fear. Useless fuckers like you should just fucking kill yourselves so you don't waste our fucking air. And then the video abruptly stopped as did all the sound in the hallway with it. Achiko stared at the phone for a while with wide eyes and tiny pupils. For a moment she felt nothing. She was actually so angry that her mind couldn't comprehend it and so she just blanked. But after a few moments, her mind caught up, and her body felt like it was on fire. Bakugo said he was gonna go train by NU Forest, Mineta said, and without a word, Achiko stormed off. Once Achiko was gone, Mineta took out his phone and started texting Yanda. I'm guessing you saw the video? Yes, and I have to say, I'm not very pleased. Father is definitely going to dislike this quite a bit. Yanda responded. Hey, the only way I could get that Bakugo ass kicking you wanted so badly was to get Uraraka riled up. And now she is. Mineta defended. I'm gonna link you to the cameras I have set up in the forest. You should be able to watch and record the battle from there. Very good. A bit sloppy, but overall a job well done. Yanda texted back. I'll text you once I'm done watching the battle. But first I'm going to make myself some popcorn. Mineta smirked as he read Yanda's last text. Let's see how smug you are in a little bit you brat. He then started texting someone else. Fu, do you have the data? Yep. Fu texted back. And I've already planted the evidence. She's not getting away with this. Even dad can only be so forgiving. Mineta's smile grew. It was time to teach that girl lesson. No one takes Mineta for a fool except Mineta himself. Bakugo was gonna kill Mineta. That little shit had told him that someone challenged him to a fight in the forest and so naturally, Bakugo went to beat the crap out of whoever was dumb enough to challenge him. This forest was far enough away from the city that no one would find or hear them. Unless they did something very big and very stupid. Bakugo was really excited to unleash all his pent-up aggression on some asshole, but when he got to the place Mineta marked on the map, no one was there. That fucker! I swear if this was some stupid prank, I'm gonna smear grape juice all over you, eh? Bakugo threatened as he stood in an empty opening. Smash! Suddenly, Uraraka shot out of the forest and kicked Bakugo in the face, with the full force of 30% full cowling. Bakugo went flying, smashing through multiple trees, as Uraraka flipped through the air and landed on her feet and hand. Achiko took a few seconds to get to her feet as she breathed in deeply. Both because of the absolute rage she was experiencing and because of the strain OFA was putting on her body. She could only use about 23% of one for all safely at the moment, any more and it would start taking a toll on her body. But right now she couldn't care less. All the pain was being drowned out by fury, and the only thing she cared about was making sure Bakugo paid for what he'd done. Meanwhile, with Bakugo, he was currently laying in a pile of downed trees, trying to figure out what just happened in his heavily dazed state while the side of his head bled onto the trees. Ak. Gaak. Bakugo forced himself up, the entire forest looked like it was spinning and it was blurry as hell. So naturally, he didn't have much of a way to defend himself when Achiko dived down from the sky with a tree. Slam. The tree crashed into Bakugo, smashing him back down as Achiko landed on the ground with the tree in her hands. Slam! 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 Uraraka picked up the tree and started furiously smashing it into the dazed and confused Bakugo half a dozen times before. Boom! Bakugo had finally gotten his act together and unleashed a massive explosion as Achiko brought down the tree again, utterly destroying it. Jarrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrr
As Achiko picked herself up, Bakugo did too, but with far more difficulty. His face was bloody and swollen, and his eyes were wide with fear. Not fear of Achiko, but of something far more terrifying. What the fuck did you just say? Bakugo shouted out, feeling his heart beat at a million miles an hour, and his body emitting more and more sweat. Where the fuck did you hear that? It's all over the internet. Someone snitched on ya, and now everyone knows what a bastard you are. Achiko shouted at him, before immediately launching herself at the already injured boy. Bakugo just stared at her with wide eyes, before she crashed into him, kneeing him in the face. The two of them went flying forward, with Achiko's knee in Bakugo's face the whole time, as Bakugo smashed through even more trees. Eventually, their momentum stopped, and Bakugo hit the ground on his back, causing Achiko to roll forward onto the ground. Achiko tumbled across the ground before getting onto her knees. She tried to stand up, but she was suddenly struck with intense pain all across her body. Eh. Uraraka crumpled to the ground and coughed up blood. Gah. Damn it. Both of them were now on the ground, unable to fight, not that Bakugo would even if he was in any condition to. Because it was over. The one thing, the one thing that even he was genuinely ashamed of, got out into the public. His dream was over, and it really was his own fault. Yanda frowned as she watched the fight over the cameras Mineta had set up. I'm not sure I should let Mineta upload this. It'll show father how pathetic Bakugo is, but is it worth it? As she was thinking over her plan of action, suddenly, her head started to hurt intensely, and then everything went black. When she came to, her head was still pounding and her vision was blurry. Oh. What the heck? Yanda thought as she clutched her head, and her vision started returning to normal. And when she could finally see again, she realized she was still sitting at her desk, looking at her computer. But instead of looking at a live feed of Achiko and Bakugo, she was looking at a YouTube channel. To be specific, she was looking at the same YouTube channel that released the fake video about Bakugo telling her father to kill himself, except it seemed like another video had been uploaded. This one titled, King Explosion Murder. This was the clip that Mineta had taken of Bakugo's prototype hero name. She had specifically asked for this, because it was so embarrassing and she knew people would make fun of him for it forever. But there was something else that was very, very wrong about this situation. And it seemed that this was somehow her YouTube channel as she now had control of it and was seemingly about to publish another video, this one of Achiko and Bakugo fighting. Yanda's eyes widened with fear. Oh crap. First of all, she never meant to upload any of the videos herself, Izuku had access to her computer's history and could look at anything she did on the internet. She'd assumed that the YouTube channel had belonged to Minty when it was uploaded, as she had no memory of uploading any of these videos. Second, she had no intention of uploading the Achiko and Bakugo fight, as it would get Achiko in big trouble, she didn't know how she was going to show it to Izuku, but it wasn't, like this. Yanda quickly looked for a way to cancel this, while she frantically tried to get her thoughts together. How did this happen? Why did I suddenly go unconscious? Crap. 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 Maybe I can fix this before Father Nautic. Slam. Izuku suddenly slammed her door open and fixed a glare on the young girl, causing her to freeze. The green teen stared at Yanda's computer, before glaring at the young girl, with a mix of fury and disappointment. Ah, a kabeski. Yanda thought. And so, three hours later, Yanda laid down on her bed, just waiting. Not much else she could do, seeing as she was now grounded for a month. All of her electronics had been taken away, and she was forbidden from leaving her room for two weeks, with the only exception to that rule being her mandatory community service. She would also not be receiving any allowance for three months. And there was an additional, extra punishment that would be carried out later. So now, all she could do was wait for him. Knock knock knock. Come in. Yanda said, her voice filled with barely hidden contempt. And that's when Fu and AKA came in. Well well well, it looks like evil has been defeated once again. Ah ha ha ha. AKA laughed in her head. I knew you two were responsible for this. Yanda forced on a smile and tried to remain as calm as usual. Because being angry showed a lack of control. And like hell, she would admit to losing control. Unfortunately, her eye twitching and her balled up fist kind of gave it away. I'm guessing my Netta was also working with you. Which is why the data drive I had has gone missing. Yanda asked, already knowing the answer, getting a nod in return. Well, would you mind at least telling me how you did all this? Well, it started a while ago. When I saw a weird super chat on Kiba's stream, I decided to investigate more. Fu explained. 
Turns out it was a hidden cry for help from Mineta. So after I contacted him he explained everything. The blackmail what you wanted to do to Bakugo. And he begged me to get the data back and free him from you. Of course, you had to be punished for your wickedness, so Fu came up with a plan. A.K.A. cackled. While you were sleeping, we inserted a little piece of me inside you, and then Mineta sent us the videos, and I uploaded them with your body, on your computer. So that's why I blacked out. Yanda grimaced. Could you at least take yourself out of me now? We already did, couldn't leave any evidence after all. Fu explained. Anyway, after all, that was done, I just had to tell dad that I saw you uploading a video, and once he saw the video about Bakugo, he put two and two together. Fortunately, Mineta should have already released a video showing that the Bakugo video was fake, and that video about Achiko and Bakugo was never released, so they won't get in any trouble. And how are they going to explain why they're both injured? Yanda asked. Mineta claimed they were attacked by a villain, and after realizing they were tricked, they were smart enough not to say otherwise. Fu continued. And so, everything went according to plan. Humph, Yanda huffed, before giving a mock slow clap. Well done. It seems you've bested me this time. But next time, I won't be so reckless and overconfident. No matter how many times you try, we will put a stop to your evil ways. Your arrogance will be your doom. Ah ha ha ha. AKA laughed. In other words, bring it on. Fu challenged. Two days later, Yanda was sitting in her room, reading a history book. What she could read now was filtered, and had to be brought to her by others. Knock knock knock. It's me. Izuka said to her mentally. Come in. Yanda sighed as she got ready to give her practiced apology for her action. Izuka came in, and immediately Yanda's mind went blank. Because in his arm was an animal carrier, containing a small pink cat. This is the second part of your punishment. Izuku explained as he closed the door and set the carrier on the floor before opening it and releasing the cat. I figured perhaps maybe you had a little too much free time, so I got you a cat. You will be required to keep them fed, happy, and healthy, and if you don't you will be punished, understood? Yanda wanted to object, however, she knew very well where she stood. Fu and AKA had incriminated her to make what she was doing seem even worse than it already was, and due to her rep, she couldn't make an argument that she'd been framed. In other words, she was in no place to bargain. Yes, father, I understand. Meow. The cat proceeded to walk towards Yanda and looked at her curiously. Yanda sighed and pouted at the cat. This was going to eat up a lot of her time. Hopefully, this will help show you how to be compassionate. Izuka said before sighing. But first, what are you going to name her? Hmm, Yanda picked up the cat and took a good look at her. How about Esper? Yes, that is a fine name if I do say so myself. Bakugo lay in recovery girl's medical room and just stared at the ceiling. The video was fake. As far as everyone was concerned, Bakugo Katsuki had never told Izuku Midoriya to kill himself, but he did. He wasn't proud of it, but he did. Bakugo had seen the comments on that video before it was debunked and taken down, the people wanted his head on a pike, hell, Achiko tried to put his head on a pike he was pretty sure. Now there was no doubt, if it got out that he really did that, it would be the end of it. And he would have no one to blame but himself. He really didn't know what possessed him to say those words. Take a swan dive off the roof. He'd been pissed off, more than normally sure, but really he didn't mean that in the slightest, and had regretted it soon after saying it. Bakugo always threatened to kill people, but everyone knew he never meant that, and yet, literally everyone believed that video. No one thought it was out of character for him to say something that horrible. Everyone believed he would do that, even his own parents admitted to thinking the video was real at first. He wanted to be angry about that, but he actually had said that. So technically, he was the kind of person to say that. And that frightened him a little. Because people who'd done things like that had actually gotten people killed. What if Deku had actually taken his own life? This forced Bakugo to reflect on everything that had happened. Maybe, just maybe, he was the asshole here. Maybe all the people who said he was a complete and total jackass, and that everyone hated him, had a point. Maybe it was time to reevaluate his approach to life. And that's it for today. I hope you enjoyed. If you did please like subscribe share the video and support the original writer. Before I go. Please check out my friend's channel. Yukarambashi's Tales. Their stories are awesome. And unlike many other channel they are open for suggestion and can handle criticism well. Now see you in the next video.